and you gonna murder this one and murder that one. You talking all that bullshit. I'm gonna put it to you like this, yo. This is for the nerds. This is for the brainiacs. This is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back. You ain't gonna touch me. You're not gonna do nothing. You are not above me. I bet you wish you was me. I know that I know. What is poppin' everybody? And welcome back to another special episode of the Only Friends Podcast. Oh. Where it's <laughs> me and my only friend. Which includes, <laughs> but is not limited to, my only friend. What is poppin', Matthew Hunt? I'm doing well. It's nice to be over here for change. Yeah, yeah. you get the beautiful background. <laughs> I get, yeah, a whole yeah. different perspective. On yeah, that. you're not like... He looks dark, though. No, he looks great. That's because, you know... On my, on my screens, ass. on That's, my screens, he looks great. He looks uh, I, I have to tell you, we made a comment about uh, Conrad's hourly, and he's just really trying to, to, like, send it to, out. to ensure that he's getting... We're getting our money's worth. I gave you your money's right. worth. What yeah. do you want? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. What do you guys think it. about this hoodie? I'm, I'm not sold on this hoodie. I, I don't, I don't like think I can pull it off. You? Nope, I nope. liked the white one better. That one's a bit like... There's just too much on it, man. Go back to your plain stuff. There's, there's too many logos. But it's, there's Jordan, no, it's Jordan. Bro. Okay, yeah, burn no, it no, and Jordan. No, 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 no. Listen, listen. It's a little this, like street. This yeah. that, right you now, know? that hoodie is perfect for the podcast. I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Just don't wear it out in public. Okay. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I gotta say, I turned reasonable. on yesterday's podcast. I was like, what is that hoodie? Like the white, I, one? I noticed, the white, the white yeah. one with the blue or whatever. Like I've never one. seen you wear something like that. I really like that this one. This one's a like little it. little street. No, yeah, <clears throat> Berkey's a little street. No. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> he belongs to the street. I, I, you know, I had sh I had Shulman in mind when I when I bought this. I was like, Shulman could pull this fucking hoodie mm -hmm. off. He ain't uh, you though. Shulman would never. No, wear I ain't him. Is the that. problem. I don't think he would wear. That. I don't know. I don't know if he that. would or wouldn't. My point is no. that he could pull it off. I mean, if it's a pirate hoodie in that style, he could pull off. He could pull a like a poncho off, like. Got well, the bucket hats going. Yeah, you know? I feel like if Shulman just showed up in a poncho at the table, I would just not question it. People know? would start just wearing like, them. Yeah, right. He makes the style. He is the style. <laughs> yeah. It's fetch. It's fetch. Uh, it's, 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 it's very fitting. Fetch it's very out. fitting that today's show <laughs> is titled Tice Draws First Blood. Melissa, I got to tell you, it looks like Whoa. you've just consumed a carcass. Yeah, I was going to ask Guapo <laughs> to turn my saturation down. I'm like a little like... I mean, uh, I those lips are rosy red. Well, usually it's you. I know. And now, I mean, at least I'm a girl, so well, it's a little more. Normal. It's also make me feel She's a little just bit a better. Girl. It's make me feel a little bit better because I'm looking at you, and it doesn't look like that. Not right? red at all. Not red yeah, at all. Like, so it's 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 a thing, you know. It, it's well, we've all been gotten by the. We've uh, all had the lipstick filter on. Yeah. At some point. <laughs> mm -hmm. How's that? Wow, what a difference! That's better. Yeah. Guapo, you're Much you're a magician over there. Thank you, sir. Incredible. The nice light work, miser so. has spoken. That's right. Hey, uh, look, you know, like, you guys think I only do it to me, but I care about the overall production of the show. Sometimes I'm just the one who gets fucked the worst. I wasn't sure where you're going with that. With the Speaking, you look, speaking of blood, I was like, yeah, yeah. It was a weird segue. Yeah, speaking of blood, <laughs> like, you do some blood bending? Let me cook, okay? <laughs> Just let me cook. Speaking of cooking. Uh, my man over here is in the kitchen. Young Land and Tice, you fucked me, kid. I know. In oh, many, many how'd ways. You get fucked? Well, I didn't get enough action down, and the line's clearly never going to be seen where it was. It, it, was, it was rising like Bitcoin yeah, stock. We had a golden opportunity, and we seized it. Yeah, I didn't see enough to of get it. Wrecked for like three months, so that the line just moves as much towards Jeremy as possible. True. Then yeah. you start winning. You I told like Matt I shouldn't play live poker because it'll move the line. He said, "Stop." We already have our action down. Yeah, no, I, I I'm. Uh, he, said, he said, "Fuck the side market." I, I'm, he did say that. Yeah. I'm being a little facetious. I'm not a greedy man. I got enough. I got enough in action. Uh, and I'm proud of you, kid. You you showed up and you tried. <laughs> That's literally all it took. This, all it took. this is the funniest part of it all to me. Is like everybody who's memeing, like I'll take the kid who just can see through the souls of Grandpa Santa Claus over there and <laughs> fold <laughs> King's pre and fuck your point two big blind win rate or whatever you GTO nerds are doing. Like as if you don't get to play against idiots too and just say, <laughs> Hey man, I haven't seen you three bet all day. 
I'm folding ace queen suited. The, Fuck they, off. They, I think mm -hmm. they think that you're going out there and you're on the river like, what's my MDF against this old man? Yeah. Like, right. This old guy who's never bluffed in his life. And you're like, I can't let him exploit me. I have to call with the right bluff catchers. Against like, this old man. That's how they think you play, I think. Listen, uh, I th this show is for the people, made by the people. And I appreciate everybody who tunes in. And this is not directed at you guys. Not at all. The audience, the poker community, so dumb. <laughs> that's why poker exists so, yeah. so arrogant that's why the ecosystem is so alive. dumb i mean well, like i mean the way that the united states populace sees the barometer of success is through daily tournaments <laughs> there are a lot of people there's also like so much recency bias oh like, of course I know. in the comments we're, we're everyone's like in it right oh, now is landon, it landon? yeah oh, no. La oh team landon like nobody <laughs> was saying yeah. it's right. just like and then jbex will win something oh landon right. you're fucked i'm like, so excited for him to win a daily yeah. like it's yeah. like, right. like we're kind of doing it ourselves people like just landon won one tournament because we don't ban one we're dumb too yeah right for sure the the oh, photo was incredible. We I'm so Almost happy. Hundred thousand views. I'm so happy you picked three five. Like, 100, well done, sir. Well done. Yes. Uh, I have some more ideas. I just have to win more tournaments. The irony mm. is that you actually won it with aces. I know. It's yeah. fucking ridiculous. It's it's the sickest <laughs> game of like, all time. Okay, I was there from not from nine left, and like he got scammed a lot on the final table. Like he got three outed like three times in a row. I I honestly, actually, you know what? We got our action down. Let's fucking talk about it. <laughs> Bro folds queens at the final table mm -hmm. correctly. Yeah. A good fold. Bro mm -hmm. folds uh, ace queen suited correctly. It's a good fold. Mm -hmm. Just doing all the things that you're supposed to do. Why? Because he's in the goddamn lab. He knows what he's supposed to do. Why don't you walk us through this queen's hand? Because I, for one, would have just not. You would have. Uh, <laughs> I'm not fucking not. folding queens, man. I don't think you've ever folded queens pre in your life. No. Have you? No, <laughs> you just pay. Nothing no. beats no. queens. I live in a world queens where queens is the pay. nuts pre. I think you have to just pay. Nah, I open. I open hijack off twenty five. Cut off calls. This is like six left. Uh, cut off calls off of like twenty three, which like for one, like can't do that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> can't, can't, can't be flat. Well, here. don't don't encourage it. Uh, go on. Yeah, not not advised. Button rips 20. I'm like, okay, this is nice. Should be a hand. It's, it's like tens, jacks, like nines. And yeah, like, we're happy. If he's like, if he's playing correct, maybe like an ace queen off, like a king jack suited. But sure. like, you know, we're we're asking for a lot. Uh, he jams 20. Small blind rejams chip leader. I think he has like infinite bigs, but rejams folds back to me, and it's just like, all right, someone here is doing something they're probably not supposed to be doing, and queens just like gets really bad now, especially in like a multi way all in where someone has Love it. equity ace king like flipping here to like win the tournament is kind of the wrong idea I would imagine just based off of the way that the ranges probably look. So I fold, cut off tanks, and then folds, and then button has aces, uh, small sure. blind has tens. Sure. And I would just like won the side, but. Lost got 20 bigs. Yeah, you were got crippled. One back five, so I'd have like 10. And then apparently the cutoff said he had ace king off. That like was going for like the flat, like sneak trap. Wow. Wow. Do you I think, think his fold's really good too. Uh, well, yeah, I think his fold, yeah. For, yeah, I mean, fucking hell. But like, I guess the way it's supposed to go is like, I open, three bet, cold four, small blind folds. Cold four, and then, cold four jam. Cold four button. Well, button can just go like small, right? But he's... He's, he's not going to. He's, he's going to jam. jam 20s. No, he's yeah. not going to. He's going to jam. Like, he was going to jam. I would have rejammed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, this guy would have folded, folded probably. And he would have been down to five bigs. Down to five bigs. Well, what's ad Yeah, well, like, sim wise, that's supposed to go like you open two, he clicks to cut off clicks to four, button clicks to like 6.5 or something. Yeah, yeah, it's toxic. Small blind <laughs> folds, and then you get it in. Like, that's what's jam. supposed to happen, but it's like that never happens. No yeah, one takes so, the right. lines. That was nice. And like, I guess that's one of the examples of like how like ICM lets you win tournaments, not mm. just like make you money. Mm. Like, well, it's, it keeps it's you alive. making you money and you being alive allows you to win tournaments. Sure. Yeah. But like, I guess in the sense of there's the whole conceptualization that knowing ICM means you're not going to win the tournament as often. Mm -hmm. And that's probably true in a theoretical realm, but probably in practice, it might let you win more. You know, like you can have ideas and concepts of how spots are supposed to look like good example being uh, six handed, five handed, like blind versus blind. I know if I'm the one with a bigger stack, like I should put more pressure. I should play less limps. I should play more raises. And then three handed, like I want to flip four handed. I want nines versus ace king. And I just know 
conceptually that small blind, when I was button, the small blind was second and the big blind was last. And the stacks were like, I had 60 bigs, small blind had 15, the other guy had like 12. So I know in this spot, I should just go really hard with opening the deck and playing a lot of open jams versus just playing raises. Because if I raise, small blind can take the jam spot and now I have folds. Mm. But if I jam, I force him to not play a hand. So I was just going for jams a lot. I end up jamming jack five suited on the button for like 13 effective with the shortest. He calls off ace queen. I turn a five and then he's gone. He's out the door. Get him out. Yeah. Get him out. And see, then uh, one heads up. I see him as like a, it's, it's like a cycle. It's like a market, right? Because I see him as poor people, right? <laughs> so, so, Based. but what happens is you, you, you know, you study ICM and then you're poor. So you use it <laughs> and then you become rich and then you stop using ICM and then you become poor again. <laughs> And then, Tony, this is the it's most actually, base take you've ever had. Like, super accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I love right. that so right. much. You, it's the TMM cycle. Right, yeah. The, yeah. the, 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 the TMM ICM cycle. Right. Yeah, TMM right. ICM. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> ICM will get you to TMM, yeah. which will then make you pour all over again. Right? Yeah. Fantastic, Turkey's Tortoise. Turkey's TMM Thank ICM, Absolutely and you would have gone it. broke with the queen. Exactly, yeah. That which is why I exited the cycle. Once you get the TMM, you leave. Yeah, you, you, you just realize what's going on. Once you get to TMM, you have to quit tournament exactly right? yeah exactly and you never have to exit go back. the market right you get yeah. out of there uh, yeah i liquefied what, what? Yeah. <laughs> can you tell me i got i got crypto and big bitcoin on my brain i mean it's going through the roof what are we peak gonna do highs, here baby peak highs Pump it up. Are we all time high? we, we not no, yet. not we'll yet let's just stay really at 60 close. for a while and let it settle down and then we'll then we'll yeah, shoot pump my up. alts what's yeah. the all-time high pump like 69 nice how do you not know i thought it was 72 for nice maybe the real prop bet is landon versus bitcoin Oh, mm. <laughs> I, I mean, okay. So like, let's, let's, uh, let's have a little bit more fun with this. By the way, I want to make it very clear that like, you know, this is what it is. The kid won a $400 fucking non daily. Yeah. It, it's something to be very proud of, but like, you know, he didn't go out and win the super high roller right. roll yesterday. Right. But I want to have, I wanna <laughs> hey have, man, not to the American public. You take that shit back. Right. That's fair. Honestly, like, but people probably think he has a better chance in the high roller bowl than he does in the, uh, in I know, the dailies it's because so he doesn't know really how to do the bad players, like, but he knows how to play against the good players. Right. And like that's that's kind of like what I want to have a little bit more fun with. Like I want to keep this conversation running. He wants because... to take a beat right now. No, no, not, <laughs> not that. But I do want to. I want you to get your props, and I also just want to like you know kind of shine a light on what a ridiculous concept. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is muted. Uh, it's definitely not. Oh, What's man. going on? <laughs> Why are we playing Guapo's that? stimming. Guapo's, uh, Guapo's like, I need to put something up. <laughs> I need power to put an asset there. up. I uh, haven't done it in forever. <laughs> I I just kind of like want I, I want to touch on the the narrative that uh, somehow being studied is uh, a crippling thing or a crippling a detriment. Cri yeah, it's like a detriment somehow to somebody's ability to play. Well, this used to happen to Ben C B when he was streaming, and people would say like. You couldn't beat MicroStick's cash. Like it's right. totally different. It you wouldn't understand. Time, yeah. And then he he would be playing like a twenty five k FT, and then have like one cent, two cent up. Just has like a thousand buy ins and one cent, two cent. Yeah, <laughs> just to prove a point. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's 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 like such a ridiculous narrative, and it's actually worth like pressing on a little bit because I, I think it really illuminates where logic starts to get flawed or is just like completely lost. People try to like rationalize things uh, as far as their experience goes right and they don't the, the the issue is they don't have any experience in landon's head mm -hmm. right they don't have any experience as the studied player as the the knowledgeable one so they only see what they see happening in practice which is of course guys like becker are going to rip off a lot of scores guys like lonis that you know aren't necessarily putting in the same amount of lab work they're very competitive in a specific environment that lends itself to being good at the psychological element of the game, being good at applying a ton of pressure against people who are scared money, being able to recognize like the soft pocket spots, so to speak, uh, in, in the environment. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, like good sound poker wins. You know, it's really impossible to to create some sort of conversation where you could just like point to somebody who knows a lot about the game and say, ah, 
he's a dog against this guy because that guy got the dog in him. Right. You know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like based on nothing. Yeah, it's like, what the fuck are we talking about? That would be like saying Barry Bonds couldn't really do very well at a high school level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, he's know, just, you, like, you know what the thing is? He's used to like, you know, 95 mile an hour fastballs. He's only going to be receiving 85 mile an hour. Right, like, he's going to be ahead. Uh, he's just going to yeah, be swinging. He's just going to hit everything just, yeah. foul. It's right. like, what actually we, really good. You know, it's like, <laughs> bro knows how to hit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. like put him in He'll any. He'll make an adjustment. Yeah, put him in any ring or like, oh man, yeah, sure, he can go out and smack around major league pitching, but what would he do against the pitching machine? It's like man. fucking <laughs> deposit the ball in the goddamn stands it's is so, what he yeah. would do. It's so true because when you when you really look back at the things that the live guys do well that we've had this talk time and time again is like the the exploits of it all where like they open somebody that doesn't three bet three bets and then they find a fold with a hand that's supposed to v pip in like a four bet kind of way or like appeal kind of way yeah but they're like i know this guy only has this subsection mm -hmm. and they're just doing the shortcut of actually doing the work that would be okay let's lock a range to see right. what it looks like yeah. maybe it looks like this how do i adjust and the machines are smart enough to know the same thing it's just about are we playing the same picture game as each other right if the answer is no right. then you just have to make you the, the picture game that you think you're playing yeah the studied player obviously could node lock in real time much better right. than the unstudied player yeah. just, and i think that the thing that people lose track of as well right is that it's one thing to know okay this guy's not three betting very many hands this, this guy's three betting super tight you don't know where the thresholds are if you're just trying to eyeball it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know, uh, am I supposed to fold like nines or am I supposed to only fold like fours, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Or am I supposed to continue with ace-jack suited or am I still supposed to continue with certain other hands because of how much playability they have or whatever, right? You have no idea other than to know, yeah, I'm supposed to fold more. There's <clears throat> so many variables of where the threshold could actually be. Mm -hmm. and this is where node locking a sim can get you so much further than just what your intuition can can estimate because you know you know you're supposed to do something you just don't know how much like right? good example i guess from earlier in the tournament like pre like post registration pre straight bubble uh guy with like infinite chips with probably like 10 left before you get paid so like kind of on the bubble but not really uh he opens cut off and i'm big blind with like 16 bigs and ace three suited and i'm just like I think in theory, this is probably fine as a jam anyways over the open, but I know that this guy's not playing open jams for 25 bigs or whatever when he is 100. Yeah. So that means he's going to raise and then fold too much if I jam. And the like exploit lock from looking at these things with solves is when you have an ace, you just rip because yeah. they just fold too much. And if you get called, you have equity. So I jam here like with full confidence that it's good and he folds. And it's like, these are plays where before like, I actually studied as hard as I have would just peel here because it feels so comfortable to just peel, play post flop, not risk too much. But you actually realize playing on a position sucks. Having a huge raise fold gap is a big issue, and you take advantage of that by jamming yourself. Well, I think what the I think the thing that you're pressing on there that <clears throat> is so common in the live realm, and what people believe that a lot of quote unquote exploit players do really well, is that they <clears throat> they understand risk profiles. And to some degree, I think that can be true, but only in the sense of when they heighten their aggression versus somebody that they think is really risk averse. So like when you see Chance cold four betting eight three off, it's because he has a pretty doubt in understanding of like what the risk profiles are of the two people who have entered the pot so far, right? But more generally speaking, uh, the, 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 the live guy that isn't very well studied actually is terrible and understanding risk profiles because of exactly what you said they don't recognize where the the gap between raising and folding lies and how to take advantage of that instead they recognize that like oh well mistakes will be made so i'm just going to constantly try to back end them to later in the game tree and i'll just like like my big one of the things i took the most pride in early in my career is that i was super sticky which just meant that I fucking called a lot. <laughs> and I still do. Yeah. Right? It's still your reputation. Yeah, 100% still my reputation. Some things but, never change. Right, but what you learn as you start to evolve and you get better at the game is that you have to, you, you can't keep expanding that way through mm -hmm. your stickiness. Mm -hmm. You have to expand in the other direction as well and start to have a lot of complementary aggression on top of that. And it's not good enough to just be raising or three betting pre. You need to find flop raises. You need to find check raises. You need to find triple offs. You need to find all these aggressive nodes in order to complement the fact that whenever you lean passive, you're also just going to give people a headache because they don't understand 
how to apply aggressive nodes in the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And that's really what this whole thing boils down to. And this tone of people being able to invest a lot of of uh, belief, I guess, in people that are perceived to be talented, but are also acknowledging to be unstudied. This isn't new. This is the exact same narrative that came up whenever one airball well, it's was the, running it's his mouth. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it makes sense though, like like psychologically, right? Like because if somebody, you know, the whole idea is uh, this wouldn't work in my games. My games are different, therefore I don't need to study your, mm-hmm. your strategy. Doesn't apply to my game, so mm-hmm. I don't need to learn this strategy. Yeah, why would I use? It? I'm not going to use it in real. And game, really, yeah. like honestly, it works as a cope to not study. Like it's like, uh, oh, if this guy doesn't study yeah. and he wins, that means I don't have to study. Right, like, I can win. Yeah. yeah, and it's like mm-hmm. this. This is like the endless cope cycle <laughs> of like right. Uh, and because I Which know is because great I used. It's worth. When I first started playing, I said the same things. So I yeah. was like, "This isn't that doesn't apply." Like people don't do, mm-hmm. but it's it's not true. You're just lying to yourself. It's yeah. like cope, and then you see somebody it's a way to be lazy, like you said. It's like, a way yeah. to be lazy, and you see someone embody that what you think when really they're probably doing more work than you would have but would be, ever dream of doing anyway because they're like studying in a different way or whatever. I did this too for reps. what it's worth. Like I, I when I first started getting into poker and playing live, like and I was under Jeremiah's stable. I was like, what do I need to learn? I was winning at 200 zoom on ignition. And I was like, what do I need to learn theory for? What right. do you mean run sims? What do you mean I'm playing fucking 2-5 against someone that doesn't know what's going on? Why would I do this? And mm-hmm. he's like, the point is you need to know what the baseline is before you can know how to actually take advantage mm-hmm. of something yeah. like that. Yeah. It's a really hard thing for like people to grasp when when they have like an underlying belief that I can do this without studying or like I, I can just win because well, I'm good enough. Or they inherently. have, they have won maybe because yeah. the games are very soft, but they, but they, you know, the dynamics change or they can't move up stakes or there's, you know, a bunch of other things. So like, yeah, if you're just winning in your game, you don't, maybe you, you don't see the, the ceiling that, that actually exists. Yeah. Well, I, I think the bigger thing is beyond the cope and, and beyond not seeing what the ceiling is, I, I think what what is more clear to me is that they're not actually able to identify where win rate comes from. Right. And that's why I brought up the airball thing is because if you recall... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you recall during airball... Not, How do you not cut to her? Neither of us... <laughs> I thought I was expecting it. Neither of us had ever played heads up before, so it wasn't like as if this was an unfair match as far as like one person was very well skilled in the other. But if you remember what the sentiment of the community was... It was very largely, uh, well, Airball's unpredictable. He does all this crazy stuff at deep stack, no limit hold him. And the deeper they get, the more, uh, the more you know, tough spots he's going to put Berkey in, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, what a crazy narrative to believe that somehow you can just do that at random, right? Like right. you just have some innate ability to mm-hmm. find spots to put somebody in a difficult decision just because stacks are deep and you play all the hands. It's like, first of all, we're playing heads up. You're supposed to play all the hands. So whatever advantage you think you have by being wider, and this is another thing that, you know, another slight tangent, but it's like the idea that if you're playing a cash game and you're playing double the VPIP as the field, that somehow that's a strength is insane. It's just like, you can't take half the deck that's supposed to be folded and suddenly turn it profitable yeah. mm-hmm. just because you like to fuck around and find out. And like it, It's also like they... They just assume that, oh, we're going to be able to put people in these tough decisions when in reality, the more that goes on, the more someone's playing too wide of a range, they're just playing this like, quote unquote, unpredictable way. You just get to a point where it's just like, well, you're just over bluffing every spot. So I'm just mm-hmm. never going to fold a right. bluff catcher. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I have no tough decisions anymore because you have too many bluffs everywhere. You yeah. Know? Like they're not like... Uh... It's not like they're playing in a perfectly unpredictable, like balanced, like, right, like you know, un- it's, it's like when you play balanced, um, yeah. uh, rock, paper, scissors, and it's mm-hmm. like, you're not going to do exactly 33, 33, 33. It's like, exactly. you're still going to be like, have tendencies. Right. And if you, if you try to play unpredictable, really the, what ends up happening is you're more predictable because as soon as someone who's good at this game knows what <laughs> side of the line you're at right. in the spot that matters, like the bluff catching spots or the folding spots or whatever, all they have to do is just make a very simple, massive adjustment in one direction or the other, and they absolutely wreck you. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, like there was a spot that I played yesterday uh, where cutoff opens, guys, wait, like same guy actually, way too wide guy. He opens, like plays too many hands, like lost with some good hands. Uh, so like not in a good mood, but he opens cutoff. <laughs> I call button with Jack nine of hearts. So I'm like, 
Can this three bet? Probably. Is that the most beneficial to me? Probably not. Just because if he plays too many hands, final three tables, final four tables, that's bad for me too. Uh, so I'll just peel, like keep his range wide. Mm. Um, keep the pot, like not smallish, but just play uh, in position. Uh, flop comes. King, nine, uh, seven. Uh, he see bets small, I call. Turn is a six. He see bets small, and I call. And the river is an eight. So there's a four liner to like a 10. And he bets small again. And I'm like, man, like this is really, like this is really shitty. Like I was going to call most of the time, but like I know he's playing too many hands. And the price I just got in this bluff catch is like five to one. Mm -hmm. He goes like B20 or less on river. I'm like, all right, you know, like can I turn my hand into a bluff and like jam in? I'm like, that doesn't really help me because he's either bluffing or he's not. So mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to call. Hope to not see a King X that like ravages me here and just like goes for small value. I call, he has like eight, four for rivered eight. Mm. And I'm just like, wow. okay, cool. Like this hand should not happen in theory. Like in theory, I'm supposed to fold pre because chips are worth a lot. But in practice, I'm like, I think I can just play better than this guy in this moment with 30 bigs. And like, let's just see what happens. Yep. And it ended up working out in my favor this time, but it's going to work that way more often than not. Right, because he just has a whole quarter. He's too many stakes. He too just many has things. a whole portion of the deck that like doesn't mm -hmm. exist. And yeah, I mean, just to wrap this point uh, before we move on, like that was the the big takeaway with Airball doubling down on like what Matt said, where it's like the narrative was he's super wide and so sticky. He's gonna put you in all these spots, yada yada yada. And so like then we scraped his hands, and like over a seventy five hand uh, seventy five hundred hand sample, he never bluffed. He just like never bluffed for more than pot. And it became this thing where, okay, well, actually what ends up happening is he's very value driven and doesn't take enough aggressive lines. So when he does take aggressive lines, you can just very comfortably start to fold. And that just became like the easiest, most transparent exploit of all time that sure, a good player who isn't studied can pick up on it, but you have to understand like how influenced you are by the lack of showdowns right mm -hmm. all of this big money keeps going in he keeps 2x potting river in spots where like they're playing a four bet pot and all this other stuff and you just never get to see the hands it's like well fuck man maybe this guy's just ravaging that kind of thing yeah. but then you get like some some showdowns you get some confirmation and whatever and it's just like oh okay actually he's way too tight and doesn't understand how thresholds work like that was the biggest edge that i had in the heads up was that he just had no concept of where bluff catching thresholds uh, like, uh, like relied. Mergy a lot. He was super mergy when, when it came to his betting strategy, which made my life really easy because yeah. I got to call and raise a lot. And then he was super tight uh, from the bluff catching node in the sense that like as, as you got later into the game tree, he would just start overfolding, mm. which was weird because uh, obviously like, you know, the solver is just savage, man. It, like, you could be 600 big blinds deep playing a three-bet pot, and if you flop top pair, top kicker, it's looking to 3E. It's just like, okay, we have to have all the money in by the end because you're playing against 90% of the deck, yeah. and you got it here. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like just no fear of, like, running into better. Just doesn't care. Loves, right. Loves playing for stacks. Right, but, like, because he's a field guy who doesn't study and doesn't understand ranges or uh, range morphology or anything along those lines, he's thinking from this, the standpoint of, like, risk aversion. Right, and that's why I said live guys aren't very good at risk profiling, because like from his vantage point, if you give him the exact same spot where he's playing a three pot with top pair top kicker, he immediately starts saying like, "Well, if I bet large three times, I don't ever get called by worse." Mm -hmm. Right, so now the whole strategy is born off of I can't really bet three times and expect to get called by worse unless I have the absolute fucking nuts, and that's why when you face the triple, I, feel like I think like that. It's an easy trap to fall into yeah. when you don't have the 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 landscape uh of understanding solver work yeah. it's probably there is probably a difference between mtts and cash in this regard specifically because when it comes to like deep in the tournament icm like value for your chips it's almost like there is a threshold in tournaments where you need to find a range that calls and is worse yeah of course o otherwise that's true in cash too but like specifically in heads up when when ranges are so wide that becomes less of a question. Yeah. More so if they don't call it's their problem. More yeah. Stuff to call I, with. I think like, that the the missing element here is I think in tournaments it works in the inverse way where in in cash games you're looking at like well my value wants my value has to get stacks in. Correct. Therefore I'm going to fill up my range with bluffs to make sure that I can stack my value. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In tournaments you're looking at because the value of chips is going to change. There's going to be some spots where it's like 
I really don't want to have to triple off with a bunch of bluffs here. Mm. Yep. Therefore, I'm okay with sacrificing a, a lot little of value. bit of value like with the top end. It, 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 yeah, yeah, but just ICM in general. Like yeah. ICM favors smaller sizings. It allows you to be comfortable not necessarily getting absolute max from the top in exchange for not playing as big of a pot mm. and having the ability to bluff for a slightly better price. I mean, that's literally the definition of risk premium, right? Mm -hmm. Like if the equity threshold for getting value is say 60% equity, uh, and you have a 15% premium, now the equity threshold is 75%. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. exactly. And that, that's something that people don't inherently understand. It's impossible to just inherently yeah. understand that. Like there, was right? a, there was a hand I played, I want to say final two tables, where I opened king-queen off from hijack, big blind calls, and we're like 23 effective. Board comes 753 rainbow with a heart. Turn, queen of hearts, river is a nine, like brick. Mm -hmm. And flop goes check, check. Like, it's not betting this flop. Bad flop. And he probably has leads. And I don't think he leads enough. So yeah. if he doesn't lead, I have a pure check back anyways. If he plays no leads, you just never bet. You just yeah. can't bet. Uh, turns a queen of hearts. He checks. I'm like, okay. For chips, I would just go like GO2, two, which two is like eight, yeah. pot. Maybe a little bit more, but around pot. I'm like, with ICM, like, I can't just go pot all in here. Because I don't want to go pot all in here with, with my bluffs and things on those lines. So I go for bet 75%. So a little bit smaller. He calls. River's an offsuit nine. He checks. I'm like, I just have too many hands that look like I can be bluffing. Like the ace lows, like ace fives that I would check back flop and then bet bet. So I'm like, I can't jam here. Like jamming here is not what I want to do with my bluffs. So I go bet 75% again and have like six to seven bigs behind where it's like, I want to do this so if I do get called and I'm bluffing, I still am in the tournament. Mm -hmm. right. And if I'm playing for Chippy View with registrations to open, it's 2E all in. Yeah, yeah. But that's just how the game needs to change the deeper you are in a tournament. Everything scales down a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you have that little bit of chips left over where you get to sometimes save the chips in the event that you run into a better hand or something. Like if he has a better hand that doesn't jam, <clears throat> like if he rivers two pair or something, and he just check calls, Oh, I saved seven big blocks. Yeah, right. Yeah, and like you said, it's very important you. to do that also with your good hands, so you're not, you know, yeah, so you're balanced. It, you're not it, getting, it, you're not getting exploited. And it's also really important to not like forget to bluff in that spot as well. Like people look at ICM and they think, well, we just <clears> have, <throat> now we have a bunch of spots where we just don't bluff. But the problem is, if you just never bluff, a you don't win pots without showdown. Right. And b they have no incentive to pay you off anymore. So you, you still have to have bluffs. You're just bluffing for different sizes, and in some instances, you're choosing different candidates. Mm -hmm. So people tend to have this like weird version of ICM where they still play hands for value and they use the same sizes and the same betting structure that they usually would. It's just they drop out all the bluffs. But in reality, what you're supposed to do is keep bluffing, just don't do it as big and bet smaller on, on average and just allow yourself to still have the opportunity to win pots without showdown. Right. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that just basically uh, stems from the, the general conversation or principle that uh you know we spoke about with jamin yesterday and it's going to be the topic of strat chat today but it's just understanding um how ranges are comprised and then how the the dynamics at play whether it's a cash game uh, a tournament pre-icm a tournament post-icm whatever whatever is influencing um the decision making process street by street how that's then going to impact the shape of those ranges moving forward um, whenever we get to the point of, of, uh, you know, first constructing our range and then moving into, uh, the next street thereafter, it's very important that you have some sort of vision, not only over what your range looks like, like you want to have some control there, but more importantly, what the response range is supposed to look like. Because again, if you don't have anything that can call you that's worse, it's going to be very difficult to find proper value bets, especially like when you're in the ICM land where, you know, risking these chips become a lot more of a hazard than actually finding reward. Um, so I, I think off of that, now's probably as good a time as any to, to shift into the strat chat conversation. And before we do that, we have a uh, new course out by Andrew Brokus that covers exactly this topic. Mm -hmm. It's called Range Dynamics, and it basically just explains in a very simplistic way over the matter of five videos uh, what it is to shape your range decision by decision. 
Hello and welcome to Range Dynamics. I am Andrew Brokus. We are talking about how the interaction between your range, your opponent's ranges, the stack sizes, the positions, and the board interact to determine the big picture strategy. Understanding the range dynamics helps you understand your opponent's incentives and predict their actions, which enables you to hide information about what you are trying to accomplish with your own hand. So that new course is Range Dynamics by Andrew Brokus. You can find it now on solvefory.io. Head over there, just sign up for the all-in access pass, and you will have access to not only this course, but hundreds of others, including uh, about a half dozen that Brokus has done himself. They're all amazing. Yeah, he's the best. Uh, he, he legitimately is like one he's of the best the in the space. Uh, him and Hunt really leading the charge for all of our content. I don't care what Dneg says, man. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. You guys are great at what you mm -hmm. do. I appreciate that. Maybe one day Dneg will actually do his thing where he says he's going to review all the courses and he'll watch my stuff yeah. and go, oh, you hey. actually don't suck. Literally no <laughs> fucking chance. No. Yeah. But, you know, it's a nice thought. He's going to do all the other sites and he's going to gloss over us completely. <laughs> he's just going to, like, ignore the fuck out of us. Well, yeah, we're not an MTT site because, you know, I don't play them. Yeah. So apparently that just... And nobody else on this site wins in MTTs, and right? All... <laughs> Also, there's another whole other aspect of tour or of poker out there. You know, yeah, it's not right. just tournaments. But I digress. Tell that to the public. That's what I've been trying That's to true. say. Yeah, come on, get in the get in uh, the cash game. And honestly, like <laughs> the majority of our stuff it isn't even geared towards one or the other. <laughs> yeah. It's just. It's just straight how to think theoretically. You've the literally been out of the cash game. I'm not games. even in the cash game. Well, you're in the... <laughs> I haven't played in like two months. You're in the crypto game. Crypto yeah. streets. I'm, I'm when that, when, when's that course coming out? Um, mm. well, it's... You, the course is going to start with you need to ram your head against the wall a bunch of times <laughs> and like lose some brain cells and then just oh, click, so, click a bunch of buttons. So you're doing a tournament course. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Was, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, there's definitely some people out there who've already done that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll take them on. Uh, Who does taking guide on to shit coins. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, get, get lucky. Yeah. That's good. Sounds like tournaments to me. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's hey, actually, honestly, yeah. I might be a good tournament coach. For you. Maybe you don't even need to coach. Just go watch a couple hunt videos. You might yeah. be good to go. I might be ready. I, I, watch out. <laughs> I, oh, well, I'll be on the cruise. I might win uh, That's true. something. That's true. We'll put, you, we, in the, we'll put you in the, the daily. We'll put you in the 240 <laughs> ladies event. He says Watch this out. now before she loses like sixes versus ace jack and goes, why do I waste my fucking time? I, I will, you guys will have a voice memo from me. And like, oh, oh yeah. it's just about, oh, you just have to run good in all the high EV spots, huh? You just like, doesn't matter what happens before then. As long as you're deep, you have to win the flips. Like, it's like... Yeah, okay. I think actually we should end the whole Landon segment just reminding everybody that he got incredibly fucking lucky to win this tournament. Probably had no skill whatsoever, and mm -hmm. I'm still booking plus 120 on Landon Tice if anybody wants to slide in. <laughs> yeah. Just throwing it out there. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, all I had right. six bigs at one point, then one a flip, and then I won ace jack. You're not oh, fucking you, you helping, man. You also won man. the ace king versus aces. I did do that. Super lucky. Yeah. See? Beats well, aces, has aces. So what it's worth... He he tried to he tried to set a trap. <laughs> he tried trapping me, where I I go for a three bet off at fourteen himself. with ace king suited. He calls pre flop comes a flush draw like SPR point eight or point seven. He checks. I just pile. I'm like I'm not sure. I want to go small. Are, are we implying somehow that aces misplayed their hand? No, it well, would have I mean, gone in anyway. Yeah. I mean, what, the, what what are we talking about here? Can but we he move tried on? To set a should trap. Be, should be you're not you're not helping. I think, I think he's just saying that aces doesn't trap a lot when ICM is involved. That's yeah. All. Yeah, of course. But also, who cares? It's aces. Well, <laughs> you still stink at poker. I'm taking plus 120. Can we move on? And now? I am the new head MTT coach. Right. Yep. Yeah. Face is going to be plastered all over the software yeah. white billboards. And it's going to be like, shit coins. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Not relevant. What, make, make a what course does with it a, a title like it's a tournament course, and then people open it up, and it's like, and surprise, like, it's so, all about shit coins. So here's how to set up your wallet and go on deck screener. And they're like, that's <laughs> not... <laughs> <laughs> not what I signed I up my for. Money back <laughs> All right. No non refundable. Yeah. Uh, so today's strat chat is kind of something that we've discussed a lot in the past, and even something that I think uh, we framed some of our content on the site around. And it's the notion of graduating from playing your hand to playing your range. Now, the irony, and this is something that I think Landon and I have discussed uh, at great lengths, is I'm a big believer in hand play, but only after you've learned how to range play. And uh, this graph that Peter Clark uh, at Characters 1 put up, big shout out to him, um, kind of embodies exactly what the process looks like. And this meme is obviously very famous, but it's, it's one that's really applicable in the sense where 
when you first start out of the game, you're literally just playing your exact two cards, right? All you know is the hand rankings. You're just trying to figure out like, what's the worth of uh, this particular hand? And, you know, do I want to bet? Do I want to call yada, yada, yada? Eventually you start to study, you fall into uh, some exposure to, you know, smarter people who are either educating or just uh, educating by proxy of putting their own content out there, whatever. And eventually you start to understand this notion of range, right? And you really begin to understand uh, a little bit more about how the game's, let's call it variables, are set, right? Position matters a lot. Formation is going to dictate what the range is, et cetera, et cetera. And you start to graduate out of this notion of just like everything being random and only my two cards matter. Once you get to that point, though, I think a lot of people hit a big plateau because it complicates the game in such a way that you start to lose sight over what the actual incentives of your particular hand are because you're so caught up in the notion. And I think this is where I think this is where the the divide really begins to occur of I'll take the live guy who's out there exploiting Grandpa Joe over the fucking GTO guy fucking who's Grandpa thinking about Joe is catching a lot he's of catching a lot of here, by the way. <laughs> But you sorry know, to grandpa. But he's out Anybody there. Anybody out there who's a grandpa named Joe? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry to grandpa. You also probably suck at poker. Just saying. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, grandpa. Bro. Statistically, it's pretty likely. Yeah, it's pretty, yes. pretty probable. Um, Stop dunking on grandpa, bro. But on. You get to this point where you know uh, the the community is like, oh, I'll take the I'll take the explo guy who knows exactly what to do with his two cards versus this old man who doesn't ever have bottom of range. Blah 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 blah. It's like, yeah, no fucking shit. You could still <laughs> do that from a theoretical standpoint, even thinking about range versus range. If you know that your opponent doesn't have this portion of range, you're still thinking about range, right? And I think the narrative shifts then to, well, if you're considerate of your whole range of, I got to do this for balance sake, I got to check back top pair against somebody who calls too much in order to stay balanced, you're missing the, the forest for the trees, right? Like you're so zoomed in on one specific detail that you're forgetting about the fact that anybody who's studying still has their own personal brain. And they are actually able to use it as <laughs> crazy as that may sound. I know the narrative is that like, if you study, you're just replicating sim outputs, but that's very rarely the case of anybody who's worth anything. It's also really fucking hard to like memorize, For sure. and, like, yeah. mm -hmm. like just like ex execute, memorize and execute. That's like a lot of stuff to memorize I, if you're I, not like actually thinking through anything. I think if any of these people had ever tried to memorize a sim, sim output, they'd realize how impractical it is yeah. to try to play that way. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. You just can't do it. It's not possible. Yeah. Right. And even if you could, you wouldn't want to in most instances. Right, exactly. And that's the part that they're right about, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Like, but the, the point is, and I, I hate to let the cat out of the bag, but good players aren't trying to replicate these outputs. They're using it as guardrails to kind of understand, well, what is supposed to happen in a vacuum? And then how can I apply that to my particular environment? Like the vast majority of the study that I do with anybody who uh, plays in these very big uncapped games where you're thousands of blinds deep and stuff like that. It's never looking at a hundred big blind sim and saying like, okay, I'm going to do that. Right. It's looking at like whatever depth we can actually get our hands on. That's reasonable. Uh, as far as like range construction goes and then playing with the boundaries and saying like, okay, well, can I toy with, with this particular, uh, fringe, sort of hand class right like maybe i can get a little bit wider mm -hmm. with my suited gappers maybe i can get a little bit tighter with my offsuit ace x because i'm finding that you know there are issues with this that or the other but it's always born off of a bigger principle right where uh you know you start to just have some environmental um observations where it's like well a lot of people are a little hesitant to call three streets so maybe i need to find ways to like delay both my value bets and my bluffs to turn in river more uh people are afraid to play big pots or they are encouraged to play big pots all of these things they're greater principles right but it all distills back down to well, what ranges are doing these types of things so i think you know what this with this um notion that, that peter's tweeting about is whenever you get to the point of thinking about range versus range you hit this plateau because it starts to become so noisy right uh you do fall or maybe maybe not everybody, but a lot of people fall into the trap of, okay, well, this is a lot to juggle. So I'm much better served in trying to replicate what the sim wants to do here than I am trying to figure it out on my own or to take away bigger 
uh, bigger concepts from this and then just freestyle in real time. When you get off of that plateau, though, and you fall to the other side of the camp where like you just have a pretty good sense or a good feel for how ranges appear at any given point in the game tree, whether it's pre-flop, on the flop, on the turn after a big bet, on the turn after a range bet. Like Once you have a pretty good understanding of how ranges fluidly move through the streets, you can get back to the hand level, right? Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> splitting strategies is an easy thing to do. And playing for balance sake is not really necessary unless you're putting in a fuck ton of volume yeah. against Riding the exact same. Cash. Yes, exactly. Who, which, by the way, even putting in a fuck ton of volume might not matter if it's anonymized, right? So when you're playing live, they just don't get to see enough showdowns. And when they do, they don't have like perfect recall. Uh, when you're playing online, if you're in an anonymous pool, those stats are meaningless. Like mm -hmm. all their HUD stats are meaningless. It's when they can specifically weaponize their data versus you that you actually have to begin to play some high level of balanced strategy, right? Right. That's a pretty rare thing. 99% of people I, won't be doing that. Correct. I think the essence of this tweet that is really important to stress though is the fact that you have to go like that, the graph that goes up in the middle and then down at the end, right? You have to start at the beginning and you have to go all the way through that to yeah. get to the point yeah. where you can effectively do it in the way that elite players will do it. Mm -hmm. Because unless you go through that process of trying to learn how to play according to ranges, you're going to end up doing things that you have only one hand in your range. Only this exact hand ever does this, yeah. right? And you start customizing your sizings and your strategies to every individual hand. And at that point, it starts to actually not be that difficult for your opponent to figure out exactly what you're doing. Right. Because your, your train of thought, if you simply follow everything that individual hand wants to do, for example, if you were to say, well, pocket aces wants to get it all in pre, so I'm just going to jam pre with pocket aces. Now, your strategy makes no sense. Because if you do that with every single hand, you never arrive at any other hand that wants to just jam pre as a bluff. Right. So you have to go through that evolution of thinking about things in terms of ranges so that you can understand at this point, okay, my range wants to have, let's say a big bet size and a check. Now I only have two options for each individual hand. Which of those two does this specific hand prefer? So that you're not ending up at the point where it's like, well, I don't really know if I should bet big or check with this hand. Therefore, I'm going to bet a medium amount. And this is the only hand I'm ever going to do this with. Yeah, the hedging is is a very common response. I, I'm curious, uh, I'll ask Conrad, and I love putting him on the spot a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to ask Conrad, and then uh, I, I think like Melissa and Landon can, or sorry, Melissa and Lamana can also uh, give me their thoughts. But I'm curious, when, when you're in a hand and it's your turn to act, uh, what is your first thought process as far as like your hand goes? Is it... Is it, uh, where does my hand rank within my range? Or is it like, what does my range as a whole want to do? Assuming that you're choosing a one size strategy and check, or is it more specifically like, okay, my hand is X and the board is Y. And, you know, I either want to go for value or bluff based off of the strength of what I'm particular holding. Um, I, I can go first, I guess maybe, um, ever since, uh, we did an in the muck hand where remember I had nines and uh, I think I three bet. And oh, yeah, then I you ended just up, went off. Uh, yeah, I went off with it. Like, I bluffed. And you're like, this hand is, like, way too high up in your range to be bluffing with. And, like, literally, since, like, and it's not that I didn't do it before, but I'm just way more conscious of it now of, like, where I fall in my range and what, what I want to do. So, like, I am, I am trying to constantly think, like, okay, well, I'm at stone bottom this you know, these are my bluffs. I, I can I can bluff here, or I'm you know this hand is way too good to bluff, but not good enough to bet. You know, like those kind of different things. So I think that like uh, I'm now like more aware of of where my range lies and how it interacts with like what I'm what like like my bet sizes. What how does that change my my range and how does that change their range? What about you, Conrad? Um. I would say that my first instinct would be like, all right, what does their range look like? And then, I don't know. I think I go from range to hand. Like, understand like what ranges look like and then look at my hand and try to like just 
expo- uh, go from there. Right. So pulling on that thread a little bit, because I think that's a good point. Do you, do you deviate based off of your hand or do you stick to like whatever your templated strategy is? Like assuming, no. you know, you have a flop C bet of 25%. No, I mean, I deviate off my hand and I also deviate off the other human. Okay. So I, th- I think that those are two really good points because they contradict one another and they, they kind of speak to what uh, Peter is tweeting. So he said, if your thought process, whenever you face a bet is where does my hand rank in my range? Uh, I'm afraid you've been poisoned. And I understand his point there because he's talking about bluff catching. Yeah, right? I think that's that's a really imp- imp- important part here that right. he's, he specifically references when you face a bet, right. right? So I think he's specifically referring to this idea that we can't afford to fold hands that are at a certain point in our range or we will be exploited. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think exactly. that's that's something that is very distinct from the idea of when we are the one who's betting and we are trying to establish what the function of each individual hand within our aggressive range is going to be. Right. So I definitely feel like he's referring to kind of a specific trap that people fall into there, as opposed to a general idea where in order to play your aggressive range well, you have to understand what that range looks like. Yeah. So where I was (laughs) going to go with this is that when you flip that into the inverse and you're actually making an aggressive decision, it actually does serve you as a pretty good guide because what you're trying to arrive at with your specific hand is can I bet or not? And how often, mm-hmm. right? So like your example with nines, right? that you, like you may look at the board and say like, okay, I'm just betting my range on this board. Mm-hmm. But if you take it to the next step and say like, where does nines rank in my range? Right. For, for the audience that doesn't know, I, I, it was an ace high board where I think three I bet th- pre. three bet pre and then I uh, checked back. Oh no, I bet. Th- you bet, bet flop. flop. You bet all three streets. Yeah, I bet all three streets. Right. Yeah, right. on an ace high board. Right. Uh, and, and the point being yeah. is that even if you arrive that it's a range bet spot, if you actually compartmentalize where does nines rank in my range, you'll realize that it's like somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And once you realize that it's somewhere in the middle, and you're taking like a polar action. So that ends up being weirdly mergy. Right. Thing. Well, if, if, well, the, on if, if the strategy so is to take a polar action on the flop, then you realize this hand doesn't qualify. Yeah. Right. Like not like in the moment, not understanding what my complete range looks like led me down that path. Exactly. Right. right? So if you're not taking a polar strategy on the flop, then nines might be fine. Yeah. But what you'll understand is what Melissa just said is that because it ranks in the middle, you won't start taking a polar action unimproved later. Right. Yeah. Right. So you're going to start to shift a lot more passively. Like that check. Yeah, yeah, maybe bluff catch, whatever. And, uh, you know, pulling from, like, what Conrad was just saying, there is this, ne- uh, like, this element of, of freestyling. So there are a lot of board textures where I play two sizes. Uh, maybe not a lot, but there are board textures where I play two sizes. A good one being, like, ace-king-five. A lot of people will simplify to mm-hmm. big bet and check mm-hmm. or just range bet. So those are their two like strategies. Quarter and, and over bet, right? That's, how, that's what I play. But, um, like, if you simplify to one strat, what you'll find in, in the solver, depending on formation, of course, is you'll either play, check or something. yeah, you'll either play, like, three or check, uh, or you'll just play pure quarter for range, right? Okay. Um, I want to be as aggressive as possible, and I want to be betting as much as possible, and if I know that quarter is available and big bet is available... I think I can find a way to balance that in real time mm-hmm. that isn't going to leave me exploitable because if I choose either option, my opponent doesn't know that I'm actually splitting. Right. Because both of them occur in in reality mm-hmm. and check is pretty infrequent. This, I think, is a really important point because th- this is one of the key aspects of, of information that particularly in live poker gets obscured. It's that <clears throat> excuse me, when your opponent takes a strategy or when you take a strategy, and they see you make a certain bet size. All they know from that is that that bet size is part of your strategy. Correct. Yeah. They don't know when you when you overbet that flop. They don't know if you're playing overbet and check, right? Mm-hmm. Overbet and small bet, or maybe I mean maybe you're maybe just like, range betting for <laughs> overbet, right? like yeah. just maybe, making yeah. mistakes. Maybe you fucking misclick. They don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and they and the same the same goes for a lot of like uh, Landon talked about a potential lead spot earlier on where villain is supposed to lead in the big blind. If the flop comes seven five three and the big blind checks, you don't know if they are range checking or if they're checking some and betting some. Right. And that's yeah. a massively different effect on your strategy, depending on which one of those two things they're doing. Quick I guess fucking, the only time uh, you'll sorry. know is if they check in the dark. That's Literally. why I said you shouldn't check in the dark. <laughs> right. Thank you. This is why I said it's bad to check in the dark. As soon as you see someone check it, in the you, dark, just fish tag them. Well, that, like, oh, I'm that's saying, just like, me. <laughs> 
Do you check in the dark? He yeah. does. Yeah. 100%. Why are we doing right. that? That's just what I do. And, 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 and like, no leads. Like, <laughs> people do think it. they're being deceptive by doing it, but you're actually giving more information. Well, he's just saying, who are you fooling? He's just saying that he has no leads. That's all. But that makes That's huge. That's a very big thing. The total stimming right now. I don't care how much. He's freaking out. He's freaking out. If someone checks in the dark, and then if someone checks in the dark, first of all, as soon as I see that, I'm already planning like what boards am I, what boards am I going to adjust on based on the fact that I know they have no leads. Right. Right. And then second of all, if they check dark. And it comes seven five three, like Landon said. There's a lot of spots in tournaments where it's like, oh, I don't have to ever bet anything, right? Mm -hmm. Because they checked range on a board yeah. where they're supposed to almost lead range. Like if right. you have right. like, if you have no leads, then the reaction would be like, check more. Because uh, like sometimes it's pure check. Sometimes it's literally be. if the board is so good for them that they're supposed to be donking a whole bunch, right? And they check range. Now you just never bet. They're putting you in such a fucking shitty spot. Guapo. Or I'm sorry, I should say, great spot when they check. Yeah, because like they're dark. just giving it's you a free check back, yeah. you know, yeah. when they're not supposed to. They're supposed to put you in tough spots by leading a lot, That's, and they don't. But now yeah, checking, like che checking dark has, like, suit. directly cost them EV. That's what I meant mm -hmm. to say. They should be putting you in a lot of shitty spots when you right. just lead right. 7, exactly. 30. Yeah. And it's just like, cause you just ba they can just barrel off a lot, and it's just like, you're just sitting there with nine. You're like, uh, this is stupid by river. It's right. just like the cue, the classic, oh, like, in my game, like, nobody leads in these spots. Because what you do is you check in the, you check dark you Where check to the razor start? it just started because you just stay in flow yeah yeah mm -hmm. and it's like well i'm glad that that's the case because if they were better they wouldn't be doing that right <laughs> yeah it's it they, they just you know most people are going to gravitate towards simplifying the game and they want to reduce their decision fatigue as much as possible mm -hmm. you are mostly going to check so for them simplifying to always checking they don't think they're giving anything up but you are giving up a sliver of something well, if you really never even consider anything. exactly like that's the thing is like it's all risk reward and you're risking giving out more information and you're not yeah. gaining anything right. the funny so. thing is like that if you did range check all boards but you didn't check dark it's kind yeah, of fine. It's fine. Like, because right. at least your opponent isn't preemptively right. exactly. gaining the information exactly. that you have no leads. Yeah. Right. That was if my you, point. If you check on 753 after seeing the flop, they don't know if you have leads or not. Right. right. So they still have to respond accordingly to where you might have some leads and some checks. Right. That's why you give them more information if, by checking exactly. in the dark, not if, being deceptive. If, like people and, think and they are. And especially, this is especially true. Pissed. He's so I'm pissed. just saying. You know what they do? Like, listen. <laughs> you guys, wait, here's hold another on, thing. Hold on. Did you and Guapo, like, get in an Dude, argument yeah. about he this at some at point? He yells at me all the time. Because you're fired <laughs> up. Sorry, we'll go Guapo. get something to eat after a session at the Jewel. And, like, as we're walking to the restaurant, he's just yelling at me, like, <laughs> why you should not be doing Actually, this. Actually, it's kind Actually, of funny. Lamata yells at Guapo so much, like, in the I mornings. <laughs> I don't yell at him. I, I, I just, what, what you guys have to understand listen, about I Brian. Have an Italian, I, have a, I have a shirt. It says, I'm, I'm Italian. Italian. I'm, I'm not yelling. I'm just Italian. Well, what you also have to understand is that it is. Uh, th this is reinforcement for him when he's learning when he's learning processes, yeah. right? right? So it's like yeah. when he starts to feel confident enough to be able to raise his voice at you <laughs> right. for getting it wrong, yes. like that's cementing something in his head where he's like, okay, like We're I know somewhere. this. We're and, 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 yeah. oh, sometimes with... <laughs> when I do get frustrated, I know like Guapo will do something and like I know that you know that it's not... A correct thing. yeah yeah or a thing but you do it anyways and you're just like <laughs> you're like and i'm like why why are you doing that when you know that's just not a thing you're like well what is the explanation like, copium. <laughs> just well yeah <laughs> no, don't get me wrong like there's there's fun ways that you can play yeah. with these elements in game like if you're playing against a rack and you want them to feel a little more comfortable and like maybe you trap the little pre you're like course, oh i'm gonna yeah. check you in the dark buddy you yeah, know what yeah, i mean yeah, whatever yeah, it yeah. is what it is yeah. for sure there's there's fun but you're gaining and I something think that's there. what guapa was doing no it's not he doesn't know these fucking people i'm here to defend him but like he definitely Saul was checking Goodman. in the dark oh, yeah. like as a playful kind of yeah thing. yeah yeah he's definitely spotting the people at the jewel because he's so much I, we forgot he's winning 30 dollars an hour listen, at one three right my bad. Am. My bad. Uh, so, i um no so i i'm here to defend you on that one thanks buddy it's, nikki it's nikki's true. defending you in the chat she's yeah. just spamming it's fun loves, it's fun it's fun she loves do you want to have fun or do you want to make money nikki right she definitely Probably checks turn in the dark. Stuff. All the yeah. molders yeah. are dark. <laughs> no, this is what I was gonna say. Like they check so many times. It's like I'm the aggressor, and it's it's a like dynamic board, and they check they call my turn bet and then check dark i'm like yeah oh that's the greatest thing ever like right i know i'm not gonna have oh to like a bad yeah. card's gonna come and i have to like face like a bet and you know what's, like, what's funny, i can just make all the decisions so easily what's now. funny as well is you can't plug this into a solver or i mean there you can kind no, of you can you can, you can give them range check. right but yeah. What, yeah, what i mean is you um if you you can do this maybe on po where you change the game tree or whatever but like it's hard to lock for this but anyway the 
if you knew that they were never going to donk bet every street. So if they preemptively told you yeah, that- I'm never I, gonna break flow. If I check whatever, call yeah. the flop, I'm never going to donk the turn. Or right. I'm always going to check the next street dark out of position every time. Mm -hmm. It actually changes your strategy on the previous street quite a bit. Right. Because yeah. you, what's now going to happen is there's spots that they're supposed to like get a really good range card for them and lead. But if you know they're never gonna do that, you get to realize so much more equity mm -hmm. across every street. Yeah. You, you could do this on wizard AI. You can just run it to Wizard completion. AI, Wizard AI isn't sequential street by street. Wizard AI solves each street individually. And the oh. when you okay. if you change the river tree, it doesn't affect the flop. So you can sim. do it on I PO, see, I see. but not. Okay. Yeah, you can do it on PO. That's why I said it's hard to do it because you have to set up the full sense. sim with no donks in the tree. And then mm -hmm. you also have to run a separate sim with donks and you have to see what the difference is. Right, right, Some right. people do this uh, by accident sometimes with value. You know, where a flush card completes or a board pairing card completes and the flush completes too. And then like they lead all in. You're like, God, like, like how did you do that? Like I was going to check back if you didn't. Uh -huh. That's why it's good yeah. in yeah. some spots. Like yeah, there's yeah, instances yeah. where you do want to retake the betting lead based off of the range that the in position player is going to barrel where it's mostly called one pair or two pair. Sure. But then a flush comes and plus a straight plus a paired board where you're calling with the second pair. Now you're like. But in practice, that's never a bluff. They just don't do it as and a bluff. In, ne ne never it, obviously is in, extreme, but yeah, it's rare. Especially in like low stakes. Yeah, like yeah. It, it, they're saving you from bluffing. They're 100% saving you yeah. from yourself. Sometimes yeah. I have to remember <laughs> that. We're like, I'm just going to triple it off and they lead jam. And I'm just yeah, like, just well, like, okay. I mean, I was going to be out it of the tournament. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's like, oh, thank you. I, I didn't <laughs> right. have to fire the third barrel. And yeah. the, the, the main reason they do that is because the most painful thing for a low stakes player is having the nuts, checking the river and seeing you snap check. 100% uh, like, of the time. The, that's the thing. That's not just low stakes. It's the most painful thing in poker, period. No, I just well, getting I, there I and then watching it go check check and no more money going in. it's the like the most painful oh! thing is getting quartered okay that is the most painful it's <laughs> that's the true. most that's how much mixed games are you playing these days well huh? it's just from <laughs> no nah, it's like when you get free rolled like, and shit yeah, yeah. i'm just teasing <clears throat> um all right so playing i want to go back away. i want to go back to pull on this thread a little bit of what conrad was saying where he's uh kind of insinuating now that you can freestyle a bit based off of your hand candidate so this ace king five board texture is one that i think is a a, a good indicator where uh, you know, in theory, if you were, if you simplify to just one bet size, ace king is going to go big, right? Um, but in practice, like a lot of what I'm kind of insinuating you should do, you get to start to hand play because you can mix and match pretty easily and figure out how to fill in the gaps with your potential bluffs just by logicking through. You know what I mean? Like you can look at ace king five and you could say like, okay, uh, I'm going to have some broad ways that go over bet for, for uh, three triple off. And I'm going to have some wheel cards that do it as well for, for bluffs. Um, and then I'm just going to have like, you know, my ace five, my pocket five, my pocket Kings, my ace king all in big. But then you realize like, oh, well then what am I putting in small? And it's like, well, of course I want to have like ace 10, ace jack in small. I want to have like all these weaker hands. It's like, well, sometimes when you have the board locked down, like say you have ace king suited that blocks the back, back doors of the king or the ace or, or whatever, right? And it's like, there isn't really much that you can get called by here other yeah. than fives. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to just freestyle here and know that I can go small with this hand too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, same thing with like ace five. If you block like the king five suited and you block uh, the, 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 the strong hands that they could have, those types of things. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to start to go small here. And uh, really it just comes down to having that full vision over what your range is incentivized to do one way or the other. And the only way to do that is by having looked at both simplified strategies. And also mm -hmm. just start, yeah, I was going to say, starting off knowing that you can go big. Right. Like, it just like, actually, it's... Knowing the, what, it, like, what the core hands are yeah. that mm -hmm. want to choose that big size and then, like, populate around it, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think this this is uh this this carries on into a very good point. So, um, Care Corner's in the chat. Shout out to him. Uh, Peter Clark, he said, for what it's worth, I think this meme also applies to spots like bluffing opportunities, where if you reason to yourself, uh, if I'm not bluffing this, then what am I bluffing mm -hmm. in a spot that's massively overcalled or over defended, right. mm -hmm. yeah. you're just simply punting. Yeah. And I think that this is th this this works in the inverse too, or the easiest way to display this maybe is the inverse where you arrive at river some of the time where these low probability outcomes occur and you just have the board like, totally locked down like you have ace king on ace king five ace ace yeah right and it's just like fuck they, they me they can't have anything right like, like it's so hard for them to have anything what do you have and it's also hard now for your bluffs because like queen jack doesn't really want to bluff mm -hmm. kings don't uh, a king doesn't fold <clears throat> and queen high just wins 
a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just like you get into this weird area where it's like your bet frequency is next to zero, but you have quads. Right. And so you think if you, if you follow that train of logic of like, well, if I, if I value bet this, what else am I value betting? Right. And you kind of arrive at nothing. Like I really don't have any other value bets. And then you ask yourself, uh, you know, on the other side of it, like, well, I also don't have any bluffs. Like I literally never have a bluff here. Does that mean that you shouldn't go for it with quads? Of course not. Right? Like, of course right. not. It's kind of like an obsession on over obsession on balance. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, well, I want to stay balanced here. So I'm going to check down quads. Yeah. Right. Like it checked, him, it checked me and I'm just going to check back. I can't think of anything to balance my range. Yeah. Yeah. So I must check. Right. It's just more important that I see his hand right. than it is that I actually go to for value. And maybe he makes right. a mistake. That's and a really good point. Yeah. Because like nobody would ever do that. Right. In real life. But like they, they do that in like. They do the inverse with the bluffs. Right. They do They'll the say like, oh, well, yeah. I have five high here. extreme version of that. Exactly. Mm-hmm. They'll be like, well, yeah. I have five high here and if i don't bluff this then what the fuck am i bluffing right (laughs) Right? it's like well sometimes you may have made a mistake earlier and there's no reason to over compound here like Mm -hmm. there are so many board textures where like bluffing is just really 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 hard right nerfed uh it's it's kind of sometimes you're supposed to check back like hands that can't really win like it's right. not always supposed to but but you just lose that's, sometimes that's that same example that, issue, that like, same example is is a very clear one where it's like it's ace king five ace ace right and they defended two big bets well they have a fucking king or an ace yeah mm-hmm. you know like they didn't defend two big bets with five four right so it's like when you land on the river with a five with, with five high it sucks mm-hmm. but this is one of those rare occurrences where it's like you don't have to think to yourself like, well, I would bet quads here, so I should bluff five high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I don't bluff this, then what am I bluffing? Because this is clearly bottom of my range. It's yeah. just like I can't win. So right, it's like yes, you I've can't win. That so many times you can't win. Lock into that because <laughs> right. they are just over defending well, this well, bet. Winning is not making the bluff. Right. right, not making the bad bluff because like it's all about like your EV, right? So like not making the bluff is plus EV, making it is negative. I think EV, there's so that's the win. There's two other things as well that we have to keep in mind here as well, which is that number one. The really rare, unusual runouts don't contribute a ton to your EV because uh-huh. they're mm. really rare. Exactly. Right, right. So yeah. if you end up under bluffing some obscure runout like Ace King Five Ace Ace, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. The yeah. second thing is that a lot of the time, if you end up on the river in a spot where you feel like your opponent is massively underfolding and you just can't bluff anymore, usually you did something wrong on an earlier street. Right. Mm. Because Mm -hmm. quite often, even if you anticipate your opponent to be the type of player that is going to be quite face up, you can alter your earlier street strategy in some subtle way to make sure that they still have hands on most runouts that are going to fold the river. So you may not necessarily want to go big bet, big Big bet, bet. or you may want to make your turn big bet a little bit smaller. So it's like pot instead of 1.5x or something just so that you don't end up in a line where when the river bricks off, it's now impossible for you to bluff. Yeah. And I think that's a really undervalued thing because so much of your EV comes from river spots and the the polar river spots that if you end up taking lines on earlier streets that funnel your opponents so much that they have no folds by the time you get to the river, Mm -hmm. now you don't get to take advantage of any kind of an overfold. But if you just size down slightly on the earlier street or you slightly alter what you're choosing to bluff, bluff with, you might be able to still arrive at the river in a spot where at the very least the bluff is break even and at best it might be maybe you get a 10 percent overfold or something like that right is there any worse feeling in poker when you like open cut off and you the big blind defends and it just comes ace king five and you have a five let's say we have five four suited we mm-hmm. go big bet flop get called turn we go big bet it's ace whatever and then the river you're just like wait what the fuck just happened? Yeah, you're like, how did I get? <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck is this? Like, I can't win. Uh, I just gotta give ask- up. But like, why didn't you put more chips in preflop? What is going on here? It's just, it's just a really shitty. Uh, what's situation. also really annoying is when you you get the you you have value on the river and you're just like, I, I have value like like the ace king on ace 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 whatever. Where you're just like, I can't get paid. How how the hell yeah. am I supposed to get paid here? Right. Because even if I was actually bluffing here. He's not going to think I'm ever bluffing here. Right. And I block everything that might call me. So I, I win this pot. It's, it's, yeah. it's a lose. <laughs> it, right. It's, it, it, it's a lose lose where like your yeah. value doesn't get paid yeah. and your bluffs get snapped. Mm-hmm. Right. And it yeah. simply has to do with the removal effect. Yeah, exactly. Being so extreme, mm-hmm. like on a board texture like this. And this is, this is what happens when people get themselves into spots where they, they're bluffing on a flush draw board and their opponent's calling down and the flush bricks the river and they... 
they have navigated into a line such that the only bluffs they have are flush draws. So because they're under bluffing with other candidates, they end up on the river where when the flush bricks, you now almost always get called because your opponent has only bluff catches and your bluffs are blocking all of their missed draws, which are the only weak hands they still have left. Yeah. And then when the river actually completes the flush, you can never, never get, get paid, paid. Yeah. because they know <laughs> yeah. that you have no bluffs yeah. that aren't flush draws. And when you bet, when you actually make a flush, you don't get paid. And or you get like, cooled off. Yeah, or you get lose to a better flush, right? Yeah. So this is like an absurdly common scenario. And it all comes from people, first of all, just assuming that flush draws are good bluffs in every single spot, which is not always true. But also just not finding the right other bluffs to add into your range so that when the river does complete a flush, you can still have bluffs. I think that's the Our, key factor to hone in on. Sorry, Conrad. Uh, uh, but like the, the previous board we talked about with like the trip aces, yeah. what happens is the biggest reason why your bluffs don't perform is because they're not calling appropriately. They're overfolding those previous streets right. mm -hmm. to a degree where you're fucked mm -hmm. whenever you land on yeah, river. by the time you get to river, you're, yeah. and, and especially if you're betting big and then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot and then you get to the river and you're like, oh, they only they always have it. They always have top of range, but it's like, mm -hmm. well, you've like narrowed them. Yeah, I, I, this happened to me like, I've noticed this like in game where, uh, you know, I would make on a previous street, like you said, where you say like, oh, you make mistakes on previous streets mm -hmm. that don't allow you to bluff. And I've, I've noticed a few times where I was like, oh shit, I bet too big on the flop. Now the range is too narrow that for me to like yeah. bet this turn. Yeah. And I, I reckon I was like, why didn't I, why didn't I just bet small, I, smaller? That way the range is wider. And now I can bet. I and can that's bet the, the thing turn. when you yeah. start to get to the point where you're, right. we graduate over range versus range and now right. you can play hand versus range. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you can actually correct. Right. The best players in the world are freestyling those spots once they realize that they've made a hiccup on the previous street, mm -hmm. rather than just leaning into the mistake and saying, well, template says, yeah. right. follow through. Well, right. I must compound. The, the, right. the best spots when you, yeah. can tell, you can tell your strategy is evolving and you're getting better, when the first time you have a spot where you double barrel on a flush draw board with a hand that isn't a flush draw, and then the flush draw bricks, and you have like nine high with... I, I don't know whatever suit it doesn't even matter it's not the flush draw suit mm -hmm. and you just bluff and then they just like say like ah i missed and they turn over like the nut flush draw that just missed and they just fold and mm -hmm. you're like oh that's how it's supposed to work yeah. i'm supposed to have bluffs <laughs> that aren't flush draws uh -huh. right yeah. so that they can have a flush draw that missed and then they fold when it's a brick i was gonna say aren't most like uh front door flush draws just not bad river bluffs when it comes down i mean to it, it really it depends massively on the run out but yeah, if it's like yeah, a brick yeah. if it's like if it's let's say it's like king 10 deuce and then it's like a deuce and then a three, right? The mm -hmm. most brick run out you can imagine. In that spot, you want to make sure that you still have a bunch of straight draws that don't interact with the flush draw because now the, the flush draws are the most likely check call, check call type hands for mm -hmm. them. So you have to keep bluffing with the straight draws of the other suits so that you have those bluffs when the flush, doesn't com when the flush does complete or um, when it bricks off and now you want them to have a missed flush draw. So... It's not, good, it's not that you're necessarily like negative EV by bluffing the flush draws on the turn. It's just that a lot of the flush draws that do bet the turn, when the river happens to brick off, you can no longer use that as a river bluff. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because like there will be some spots where you have called like a pure triple in theory and then you triple it off and then you get called by a really good hand and you think to yourself, maybe I should have done something different or maybe something went wrong. And sometimes the answer is like, you actually got cooler that they had what they had in their mm -hmm. range in that point. Yeah, but you can also take a lot away from seeing those showdowns because oftentimes you'll see hands that should have exited the strategy a lot earlier, right? Like they'll just show up with like middle set on the river calling three times. It's like, well, that should have either exited through a check raise node on flop or turn. And what you can, you, you can glean a lot from that where it's like, okay, number one, this person's drastically under check raising mm -hmm. these, these prior nodes. And then number two, they're probably drastically overfolding them to the degree where they feel like they need to protect their range with a hand so strong, mm -hmm. right? So what you'll just often do, the, like the way to correct course there is just, just delay one street, right? Delay one street and then don't necessarily go as thin for value because you're going to get value cut more often by somebody who's just losing track of their range and foregoing a lot of value in order to say, gotcha, yeah, I got to set on the end. To, or to they just don't even know they should be check raising. Fair. Right. Yeah. yeah. They don't have any check. It's just like, oh, like I'm in a slow play. Like I'm gonna let him hang himself. Like right. it's like the biggest thing of live poker since like call it 1990s. Like to let the guy hang themselves. <laughs> you yeah. weren't even yeah. born in 1990. But I still know about it. <laughs> from the room he knew Conrad. Yeah. I, My dad to, was playing poker was before to, I was alive. To go, to go back to Conrad's point as well, I think the the board run out is really important too, right? Because the the flush draws are gonna bluff some rivers, 
but they're not just going to auto bluff every river. You're going to have a lot of spots where if there's a flush draw and a straight draw on the board, when the river completes the flush, the straight draws are going to bluff and the flushes are going to have a flush. When the river completes the straight, the flush draws are going to bluff and the straight draws are going to make a straight. And then when the river bricks off and neither of the draws get there, that's where you have to understand what your good candidates are and what they're not. And you also have to make sure that your range on the previous streets is complete to the point where you have all of those candidates. If you only have the flush draws, then like we said, when the flush completes, you can't bluff. And when mm. the flush doesn't complete, you have only bluffs. And you don't have enough straight draws when the straight completes. You don't have the straight draw hands that miss, that bluff when the flush completes, etc. So these boards with a lot of draws are very important. And I think people are very inclined to, first of all, just overvalue flush draws ahead of straight draws, when in reality, straight draws are often really good as well yeah um but also just <laughs> they, are. they they're if you're unwilling to ever bluff without a draw there's a lot of runouts where if the board doesn't have a draw if the if the texture is like i don't know jack deuce deuce seven or jack deuce deuce six or whatever like yeah there's a couple of gut shots there whatever but you have to find bluffs that aren't draws because otherwise you are just radically under bluffing and those are the things people really struggle with that's where the range study becomes really important because you have to understand what candidates do I want to have in a spot where I can't just fall back on my equity and I can't just look at draws as good candidates. There's and almost like a goal. What's up? Oh, good. Oh, I was just going to say it's kind of a two-way street where the people that want <coughs> you to bet their value hands for them are sort of expecting those turn bets and those river bets because someone's highly aggressive or they're tricky. But it works in the same way where if the guy knows that you're trapping and slow playing your value, they're just going to give up more. And then you get no more money for your value hands because they know better. And people also, it's funny though, that people, people do this weird thing where they slow play their strong value because they're trying to get you to bluff, mm -hmm. but then they also don't bluff catch enough. <laughs> because it's like, they're, yeah. they're expecting you to over bluff. So they're like, well, I'm gonna the trap. Because the board gets worse. I'm, right, but the no, bluff just, catchers even, get worse. But even when it bricks off, I mean, like yeah, yeah. They, they, they trap you because they love trapping and they think that it's great to let you hang yourself. But then they also don't internalize the idea that if you're really bluffing that much, they should just always call you with bottom pair. Uh -huh. Right. But they don't do that. They yeah. trap you with the top and then they fold the bottom. You gotta be sure. Yeah. But then you gotta be sure. <laughs> right. Everything like, still falls back to there. linear. Yeah, yeah, everything still falls yeah. back to the linear progression mm -hmm. of how yeah. they rank the value of hands. Mm -hmm. Um, and all, as always, if you guys are interested in more of understanding how these ranges work, be sure to check out Andrew Brokus' new course, Range Dynamics. Good plug. At solvefory.io, you can find it there. Sign up for the uh, all-in access pass. A lot of good stuff out there if you're interested in exploring more range versus range, hand versus range. This is actually something, you know, I don't know if it's it's that obvious to everybody from afar, but when we built out the um, the quick studies course, this was exactly the the map that we used. We started with hand versus hand. So in other words, examine the game through the lens of this is my hand. What does it want to do? What's the worst case scenario of my opponent's hand? Yada, yada, yada. And then it became my range versus a hand. And then it became range versus range. And then it became my hand versus a range. And that was the way we tried to graduate the whole thought process. So you can actually watch that for free. It's on our YouTube channel. You can also sign up for the free roll access at solveforwide.io. Check out that entire series. I think it's like a... I don't know, like a 17 part uh, whiteboard video series uh, voiced by the one and only Chris Convalinka. Be sure to check that out. It took pigtails like two years to make or yeah, something because it, it was took ridiculously us complicated. Very complex. <laughs> uh, one of the things I'm most proud of though. Let's get into uh, the muck today. I believe we have a user submission from one uh, Manny, Ma Manny Gonzalez. Manny Gonzalez. Uh, we're we're going to check that one out. All right, Guabo, since your cousin played this hand, why don't you... Uh, Stop. That is so <laughs> El Mysterio. I love so why, don't, why don't you tell us what's uh, going yeah, on Yeah, so here. this is a submission from a gentleman named Manny. He grinds in TJ. He's a microstakes player. Uh, he says, guys, I wanted to see if I can get a little help with this hand. Guapo mentioned a couple segments ago that sometimes he overplays nut blockers, and I feel I may have done the same. He also had a question about the flop. Uh, he felt that it was a better range for his opponent, and he decided to check back. So let's take a look. Roll the clip. Roll the footage. Okay. Still two uh, for those listening, uh, it is cut off versus button. Uh, they are 190 big blinds effective. Off open. 
Ace three of Hearts, bet. Queen of Clubs on the button decides to three bet versus the cutoff. Pretty fine so far. We get a flop of deuce, four, tray, two hearts, one diamond. Cutoff decides to check, and he checks back he on the button. Checks back. He checked blind. <laughs> he checked dark in position. Checked. Checked dark in position. I think this is reasonable so far. Looks like our opponent bets half here. On a deuce of diamonds. On the deuce of diamonds turn. Now we have a nine of hearts on the river. He did decide to call on the Push turn. Complete. Our opponent goes... It's like half. Yeah. Okay. And I think this is where Manny goes off the rails. He's just gonna stuff it. I think he just stuffs it. I think he just four x pot. Manny, huh? is, yeah. Manny yeah. is such a good hand. Pretty right aggro. Now. And I think it gets through. Oh well, yeah, it's probably gonna get through a lot. Uh, so for the viewers at home, the board <laughs> is three of hearts, two of hearts, four of diamonds, two of diamonds, nine of hearts. Uh, so basically, two flush draws on the turn. Front door flush draw completes on the river. Ace of hearts, queen of clubs goes for the four x pot jam. Uh, facing half pot on the turn. I, I don't hate this. Um, yeah, it's okay. Uh, I I think the best way to examine this first and foremost is uh, less about the mechanics and more about the principles. So whenever we see this low four high board in position in a three bet pot, what is the general uh, f like aggregate flop strategy that we're going to see here? And I think it's mostly going to be big better check. I would... Actually, I think it's interesting. I think in, in three-bet pots, a lot of the time, because your opponent's range is going to be mostly full of a lot of suited broadways and a lot of pairs, yep. you're, you're going to have a lot of boards where your strategy is built around attacking the pairs and a lot of boards where it's built around attacking the broadways. And this texture, because the broadways don't interact with the wheel texture at all, I feel like just going you know, relatively passive, but like a small to medium bet to attack the suited broadways is kind of okay i don't love a big bet here just because villain probably does still have all the sets and we don't so i feel like small bet is kind of okay just not at that high of a frequency what about his check back i think this is a reasonable hand to check back i think what, it's what, probably going to be a mix at equilibrium so uh, i guess my my slight pushback against the small bet is if we're targeting pairs uh we're not we're targeting the broadways that's what i'm saying oh, oh right so I, I guess, yeah, so from my vantage point, the way that I would think about this at, at such a large depth, I think we're at like 10 SPR. Yeah. Uh, I would be thinking, and this could be very wrong, but I would be thinking of it from the vantage point of um, the Broadways are auto folds versus any size, unless they have a front door or back door. Mm -hmm. um, and the middling pairs <clears throat> are hands that we're going to want to apply uh i don't i don't necessarily want to say maximum pressure but like it's it's the range of hands that we're we're going to be playing three streets against i i think that would be or at least from my perspective i think that would be true if this was like four deuce deuce where there's no flop straight that they can have mm, okay and they can't they can't have three different sets on this board they can have all three sets right. they can have six five they can have ace five and i think that would, for me at least, that would shift this to a spot where it's a little bit more difficult to attack, like pocket yeah. pocket sevens. That's fair. Because well, I, I guess, we get wrecked. With yeah, our maybe aces I should there. specify too. When I say big bet, I'm not implying over bet. No, I know. I just yeah. mean like I. Because like four it, deuce deuce, I think we could it, just three. If it, well, yeah, if it was four deuce deuce, we would absolutely be like we can just wreck pocket sevens across three yeah. streets here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think this triple wheel, specifically where six five, they can definitely have ace five. And they turns can get a little have. dicey. Yeah, like I just feel like kings here is just like what turns can we easily bet without like being really wrecked by a check raise right you know, it's going to be a really awkward one so i don't mind betting small because that gives us a lot more ability to to call a check raise see a turn still be at a reasonable spr still use position well yeah. um yeah that's so fair i, I, I could I see don't mind small i could here. definitely see where this is like a b40 or check spot yeah that seems reasonable to me 40 <clears throat> yeah. 40 35 50 maybe i don't know but yeah. not, not big but not like like range bet obviously. when we when we have the right. ace of hearts doesn't that like don't we want to check more just because we're just comfortable with i think we out? just want to like flat out mix it yeah because I we're gonna have just... the ace of hearts a lot and he's not yeah uh right because oh, yeah, he's, he's not defending not a lot of options i think suited. i would yeah. i would probably say that the stronger our ace of hearts gets we get slightly more likely to bet it because we get we get called by dominated broadways Correct. so yeah. this combo maybe bets a bit more ace ace of hearts 10 ace of hearts jack maybe checks a bit more because we mm. can't if we're betting small we can't get ace queen to fold right mm -hmm. so we're supposed to yeah we're definitely supposed to mix it i would think but we just get value i, I think this combo like you could go either way but check is fine it's it's also probably 
slightly worth noting. Um, but like, if we have a worse Ace X offsuit, and maybe this, we should just never have those. Like, well, I'm saying like Ace like, Jack off. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if we have a hand like Ace Jack off, Ace of Hearts, what he won't have then is Ace Queen of Hearts or Ace Queen with the Ace of Hearts, mm, yeah. which is kind of nice because yeah. uh, you know, to to your point, now we do get to target those Broadways a little bit more. So yeah, we might even be able to get a little bit thinner with yeah, the hands that we choose plausible. to bet here. Um, but uh, to, to that end, we really want to have the naked ace of hearts in a delay also. Mm -hmm. Largely for like the line that ends up getting played here. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that signifies we should be jamming river on a paired board with the flush complete. Might be a little bit aggressive. Uh, I'm not sure. I, we'll, we'll get to see once we go to the wizard. I'm not sure how aggressively we're going to be playing Consulting river flushes here. It just feels like we have such a good hand on river. There's no need to jam. Like we just beat so much. Like, I would imagine the hand. I would imagine Ace Queen doesn't fold ever versus ever. half pot. Yeah. I, yeah, I my <laughs> expectation on River is that we're supposed to have two raise sizes, or at least that we're not supposed to just jam over this bet. Because Agreed. Oh, for sure. Our, that's that's for sure. True. Yeah, because our flushes, our flushes don't want to jam. Like, right. Yeah. Uh, flushes, like pocket nines wants to jam. Yeah, yeah. flushes jamming for like this massive size is torching here because. Mm. A, when you have a flush, you're going to block, block a lot of his flushes, which means you don't, can't even get called by worse very easily. He never has trip deuces, and he has all the full houses. Right. So you, you torch it when you jam with a flush. And as a result, if you're going to have a jam strategy, it needs to be, I mean, you don't even really have very many full houses here. So like, it basically needs to be nines. Nines, yeah. Nine. This, this is one of those scenarios where I do think that the sizing is too imbalanced, right? Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to... It's really difficult to to put value in there that benefits from the 4x mm -hmm. pot shove. And then uh, the other side of that coin is that it's difficult to find bluffs because yeah. you don't want to use the naked ace of hearts as right. much as like a pair. If you, Yeah, you're supposed to like, there's going to be some weird shit that happens here where like it's going to want you to, if you have like 9-8 of spades, mm. it's going to want you to like jam. Right, or right, right. Or race it's four a, of spades, right. perhaps. And you just have to be banking on them being capable of folding the nut flush Flushes. or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. So I would just have a raise strategy on this river of like, you make it like six bucks or whatever it is, or like yep. 4X his bet, yep. where you, now you can raise all your flushes. He's still going to have to bluff catch with like tens and stuff like that with a heart. Um, and I think when you, when you have any ace of hearts combo, any like king of hearts combo, if, you're, if your raise sizing is like moderately big, but not huge, I think you, you get into a pretty good spot where you can just bluff with most of those, raise most of your flushes. Yeah. And then... The, the trouble spot comes when he three bet jams. Of but, course, but you know, like, you know, you just fold your nothing. Of course, uh, yeah, like that's, you know. I, I think, I think like from a principle standpoint, if we zoom out a little bit, what we need to understand is that on the turn, we have a very clear bluff catcher and the river didn't change that much. Yeah. Uh, the nine of hearts is almost even a little bit more favorable when we have the ace of hearts. So I would presume that this specific combo doesn't fold versus half pot ever. Oh yeah. And it probably right. mixes between call and raise. Yeah, exactly. And I, I it might be, more likely at this point that the king of hearts would bluff raise because yep. we want him to have the ace of hearts when he bluffs river we want him to have like the exact hand that we have right but the ace of hearts would presumably raise at some frequency um just because it's just so good to have sure. the ace of hearts here yeah i think that it might be like a weird spot where some especially versus half pot because yeah. like he could just be value betting one pair a lot yeah exactly it, it might be a weird spot where to some degree having something like ace queen or ace jack with a lower heart might Better like buff. the queen of hearts or the jack of hearts like there's going to be some weird card removal there depending on exactly what right because he could have the inverse combo he right. could have ace of hearts queen of spades Precisely. but he's also so, not going to have money, much of that like well, well I, he will he'll have ace queen, ace, ace, queen sure. ace queen sure yeah. but what like, i was going to say was that it it really just depends on which suited broadway combos we expect him to to have at the highest frequencies right. here yeah. because theoretically pre-flop he's going to be supposed to three like four bet king jack of hearts sometimes like he's, yeah. he's going to four bet like king ten of hearts sometimes the queen's queen nice because king, king queen probably never does it well, at this depth, king queen suited is probably going to make some four bets. Okay. Like a cutoff versus button, I would expect, because button's going to three bet call like queen jack suited and stuff right. like that. So I would, like, this is where it, 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 because of the size of the pot and the depth of the stacks, it does become a little bit dependent on how he's playing pre. But I, I would probably say at this point, it's really hard to, it's really hard to go wrong bluffing with the nut flush blocker, but you have to recognize that your flushes don't want to jam here yep. because of the sheer size of the bet. So you just shouldn't jam. I don't think you should jam anything. Just raise 4X. Or yeah, whatever. I think the simplified strategy is we just play one raise on the river and right. it's not jam. Yeah, it's really hard to have like split raise sizes in spots like this. I'm going to say this hand barely raises river, like 20%. Um, I think that's fair. I think that's probably fair. I think it calls a lot. Let's, uh, let's consult the young 
Child of the Sim, the Wiz himself. The sick Talking wizard. about me? No. Oh. The sick no, no. wizard. Mr. Sick, sick wizard. <laughs> the sick wizard. This is interesting. Yeah, so Cutoff has a lot of leads on a flop. Uh, I'm gonna just have yeah, to remove that it. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me too much. Or Again, they have all the sets, them. they have a bunch of straights. Like, if you look at the button range here, the three bets, a lot of like high card Broadway go. things. I, how fucking good am I? <laughs> <laughs> Let's Nailed go. 40% right. frequency, 40% size. There um, we go. <laughs> Sven Hunt. Yeah. Sven, Sven Hunt. Hunt. Just so, call me Sven Hunt. Uh, very, very British name, Sven. So, yeah, Sven I'm just gonna, Hunt. I'm gonna set strategies manually. I'm just gonna be, if you I'm go back far this. enough, you go Wait, what two, are you changing? 2000 I'm years, changing the guys lead. in Britain's There's called Sven. Why? Yeah. Yeah. No one's leading flop. Who leads flop? In well, 10, yeah, but I, 20 I, don't, and out. I don't think that matters that much. I mean, it matters hey, it's a on ton. GG. They might. Well, what do you mean it I, I guess matter? we know the adjustment. If if uh, if cutoff checks pure when he has to have that big of a lead range, we're just going to check back pure. Right. So we shouldn't be c betting flop. Okay. Ever. Fine. We may not check right. back pure. We, we may still have some frequency of check backs. I don't know when he leads that often. Uh, when he leads this off, leading 66%. Well, the, the, the key thing, though, is that the, the actual texture of the leading range is not that different from his overall range because there's not that many hands that are super high frequency leads, basically. So the actual range that we're facing when he checks range may not be that different from the overall lead range. Let's take a look. Yeah, let's curious. see. Oh, is it going to be? He checks everything. Oh, check everything. Okay, fair enough. It is. It is. Range. I mean, he's yeah. supposed wow. to bet okay. and then didn't. I mean, he, so. yeah, he basically could range bet. Like yeah. almost okay. every candidate had a bet. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather look at the spot like in this picture versus the lead picture. Okay. I don't think any. I don't even think anybody. Okay, so everybody lead. carries forward the f full range on turn. Yeah, I think. I think. So. But I don't think. Uh, I mean, whatever. We're 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 estimating, but I imagine Button has bets. Do so, do yeah. so I mean, do I do I think we're gonna see bets some? Like, sure. Like, Are you checking back jacks there? I guess we can just like, checking back jacks. I can just no, you don't have to custom it. I mean, it yeah. is what it is. Like, just it roll is, with it. It is. What we, it we've is. already gone this this path. This is kind of the part of saying like when you check dark and three bet pots. Like, eh, well, maybe you shouldn't do that either. <laughs> uh, so now cut off because they didn't bet. Should be betting a lot on the turn. Yep. As for basically the size they chose. Yeah. Size. So I'm just gonna. Just, I mean, it, forty fifty. It's not gonna change. Yeah. Well, it's a three bet pot, so like it's a little bit different. But yeah. It's accuracy, man. Sue me. I'm sure Manny appreciates it. Mm -hmm. uh, so now on the turn, like you mix call, you can also just raise now with the heart. Actually folds the turn sometimes. That's weird. Yeah. I guess it's just in theory. Not like, with the Ace of Hearts. Well. Oh, yeah, it does. Ace, 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 Ace of Hearts, Queen of Diamonds. Diamonds. Yeah, yeah, having yeah. the heart diamond is really bad here. That yeah. suits. It makes it more likely right. they have pairs. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I don't think in practice, like call is calling is going to do too much pain to you. Uh, but yeah, it looks like you can just raise now, and it's because you have good blocks. You kind of you don't even clean up a, like your outs, so to speak, but you just get them to be really mad when they have middling pairs, because the board texture can change. Where you could probably also just get straight. value from like worse uh, not flush, flush draws. draws. The, the other the other notable thing here as well is like big the, raise size the only too. reason why we can have raises on this turn is because we range check the flop. Yeah, of course. Like it's it's really important that we don't start thinking we can get away with a bunch of turn raises here if we're already. Like, if we decided we were just going to bet a bunch of strong hands on the flop, like, we never have any strong hands anymore. We're betting the flop yes. a bunch. So, right. like, if we raise, we get called by flush draws. They're even indifferent with flush draws, which is nice because holding a five-card draw probably doesn't happen, like, ever. But, like, you see here, Jax is really mad. All of these hands can get a... You have to call with all of them at a frequency just to right. protect yourself on all He's of the different changing rivers. supposed to mix all the pairs. Like, this happens a lot. Like, people are... Supposed, they're supposed to mix everything between like sixes and jacks at some frequency here and that just obviously doesn't happen yeah like what people normally just do it the other way around where they just call with jacks and tens always and fold nines eights and sevens yeah exactly uh and then the small pairs are better because they either have boats or equity where the higher pairs aren't as good so you just shift them around where jacks feels like a good hand but it's actually not in relation to a hand like sixes right. where with sixes like you can just make a straight and like you might be able to win and sure your boat good. out is still worth the same for a jack versus a six because when we look at the button's raising range, the only thing that happens sometimes is you get ravaged by sevens. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> all right, let's not worry about that. Yeah, we don't have to care uh, that so, much. So we that. call nine of hearts. What, what the size did he bet on the river? Uh, uh, 67. I'm just going to change it to 50 just because I can't. Probably get rid of the jam too. Like, yeah. Tap, tapping 8% and it happens more now, yeah. yeah. So I can like just remove this and just play a one size. Four and a half X pot. Kind of sick though. Like you have a boat and you're all in. You're like, I'm all in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is so fast too. Like you just remove it. And it's like, 
Matt, can you imagine trying to do this on PO like three years ago? Oh my God, it's fucking Just brutal. absolutely, it takes hours. Create subtree, hours. build and go. Create yeah. subtree, build and go. Yeah, so now like we're betting a lot, but checking as well, just because in position does have a really strong range that if they decide to check back as the cutoff didn't lead. So when they go for half, they're bluffing with like their Broadway hands. They're bluffing with the like seven eights. Uh, makes a lot of sense. This is a, a good six, example seven. of what I was talking about earlier. Like they're still supposed to, they have to bluff with like seven, six of spades here, right? Like yeah. they have to find those bluffs find this some. size because they're getting, they're betting so like medium of a size that they are just getting a good price on the bluff. Yeah. So it looks like uh, with ace queen, you're mostly just peeling, but like if you want to get fancy, you can pile it. Yeah. And, there we uh, go. How often is he piling? Like seven percent. Like, yeah, oh, he never. does actually just have a jam. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, well, it makes yeah. sense in the sense of like the reopen range is going to be so tight. Yeah. Uh, Ace Deuce. This is this is not a this is not a bluff. No way. No, it's value. It has, has to be. A that's bluff. a value jam, right? It has I mean, to be. A has bluff. to be. Folding uh, flushes. He's folding a flush. Oh. There you go. You're bluffing with a duck. <laughs> bluffing with that. that yeah, quads blocker. Block, yeah, quad blocker. Full uh, yeah. house blocker. I mean, quads <laughs> looks like it's the only pure call. Yeah. It had fours mixing. It's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so you like block nine deuce, man. Yes. Kind of so, just... so this is this is interesting because it's the opposite of what we said here. It's that what's happening is we're keeping the jam as our strategy. It's just we can't even raise a flush. Now. Right, he's like, too full house dense. Like he's just got so many full houses, we yeah. can't even raise the nut flush. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Part of this is actually something that people do get right of like the fear panic of like if I go all in, you're not gonna call, and like mm -hmm. it's kind of potentially fair in some cases to have that assessment when the mm. bet is this big yeah when the when you're going for like your reopen size being a giga jam yeah so they, <laughs> they the giga, giga jam i like that <laughs> like so, we just uh, don't have boats right when, we only have nines right so when we do do that this is kind of i guess this is yeah the queen nine queen, block. queen nine of diamonds king nine of diamonds the, those diamonds that call the turn uh you're supposed to just when you when you river a nine you, you block nines full so we're all in you know right. Like you sort of see here in their betting range, like there's not many hands uh, that when you not bluff catch with the nine that you beat, but like the value hands that they're betting are just kind of better than yours. So it's almost like more efficient to bluff from this subsection just because we're trying to say that we have nines or... We're like literally, I guess just nines. Yeah, like, I mean, Deuce is bluffing. The general you know? principle of what we said is still accurate. Like we're we're really leaning on jamming full houses. We're not really trying to get too thin with flushes. I mean, we thought we'd be able to raise for a smaller size with a flush, which practically you probably could. But uh, what, you know, uh, in theory, what happens if I can just you... pencil and give a raise fifty. It right. Does, it like really what matter. what happens if you just give raise fifty and you get rid of the all in? I guess we we'll, yeah, can look at two and then. I imagine we'll go slightly more linear, but you still have the uh, even with raise so even with raise fifty because like I guess the issue is just to reopen. But... You, yeah, you just yeah. reopening is just like oh, so pretty now, tragic. Now we do raise and not flush though. Right, if, but if you're we, gonna fold them to jams. Right, that's this is kind of what I thought the original version was gonna be though. <clears throat> yeah. I, if we, I thought that even without well, they the, don't even jam. I, on you. I think. Oh, that's they, interesting. They jam, they jam quads. Oh. That's it. They oh, they don't, they don't have enough nines. I guess nines doesn't... What does nines do early? What does nines do on an earlier street that means they don't have it here? They probably, like, check river. Oh, that makes sense. Nines yeah. is supposed to check yeah, river. Yeah, pure check. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so that, that's kind of contributing a lot here, right? Because now it's drastically changing how afraid of full houses we have to be when we raise river. Yeah, because now when the button raises, the cutoff's like, oh, shit, like, you can have enough flush or a boat, and like, or he's bluffing. So when you go all in, it's like, I don't have enough value to support this. I only have quads. And right. like, that's the only hand, that's literally the only combo they have. There's right. no yeah. I, I think quads. practically speaking, the reason why we arrived at the conclusions that we did and why you could probably play it generally this way in practice and yeah. dismiss the sim here quite a bit is because people are going to miss these splits. They're not going to know to check nines and to bet fours. They're not going to... You know what I mean? Like they're just going to mm -hmm. lump everything into a single action, and it's all going to be built off all of the value. All full houses are going to play the yeah, same. Yeah, it's just going to be built off the value. So it's like they're going to bet flushes, they're going to bet full houses, they're going to bet one pair some of the time, they're going to bet some mm -hmm. some misses, whatever. So whenever you have the nut flush, you're going to be able to race rather thinly. You're not going to be able to ra race thinly with like worse flushes than that, unless you have a clear exploit on your opposition. Um, but at the end of the day, like you know, it doesn't really matter. The strategy that you're choosing here matters a lot more where you're deriving your candidates from. And the clear point to take away here is that the Ace of Hearts is not a good bluffing 
uh, attribute. Ace Queen is just worth enough pot share that it can bluff catch down, uh, and it doesn't really it doesn't really want to turn itself into a bluff. If you were gonna get exploitative and choose hands that missed, you're just gonna choose lower ranking ones, right? right. If you have like King Queen off here. You're going to choose that instead. You're going to choose wow. Queen Jack. So off, what I've like done that. is what I've done. What I've done here is done? locked the cutoff to be betting their full houses and full on the river. Uh, wait, let me. Can, by the way, uh, I saw how you did that. If you go to the filters, you can just click the entire full house category and, uh, oh. and paint that entire category. Well, uh, you're right. Here we are. We did it. We did it. Uh, just, just a little tip. Yeah. Uh, so. Now I have them betting, like all the full houses and quads would be 50. So now when they bet, we can't raise a flush anymore. And the issue is they have too many full houses in their range. Yeah. Right, so the range, the raising range is the exact same. You, without whether, having, what, with no ace queen anymore. I'm, I'm saying whether we jam or don't jam. Uh, it doesn't matter what size yeah. we give. The so, range is yeah. the exact same. Basically, it's just nines. It's correct. built around nines. That's what it, what it comes down to is it, one way or another, we can't raise a flush on right. the river. And right. that seems kind of, it's surprising, but like it doesn't even... It seems like it doesn't even matter what sizes we give ourselves unless we were to expect that villain was going to be making mistakes against a raise and calling with hands that should fold yeah. we can't actually raise a flush which means we don't have any reason to use the ace blocker as a as a block it's kind Correct. of a good example of like looking at a machine and maybe doing some light studying to realize that in this spot when we jam for 2x pot fours and threes are indifferent but if we play the practical game of people will never fold a full house in their lives, bluffing here becomes a, a complete torch. Yeah, yeah. The, so this is exactly the scenario that like uh, Carrot Corner was trying to point out where if you're thinking about like, if I don't bluff this, then what do I bluff? Well, the answer is nothing because they don't bet fold. Yeah, right. so like, And that happens a lot. Uh, you know, there's, I, I talked to Landon about this. Uh, I don't want to divulge too much, but basically there are like people that I play with in my game and in other games where when they choose to bluff on turn uh they choose these weird sizes that are never really practically used and they also choose middle of range candidates so that when they're jammed on they can't fold which is insane yeah right like um you know there was a scenario where uh when i was playing oaken heads up he check raised me on the turn in a four bet pot where the turn was an ace on like jack 10 five or something like that turns an ace putting two flush draws out there and I had the bottom wrap. I had like nine eight seven five or nine eight seven six, something like that. And I was bluffing because I didn't have either either flush draw. So I was just going to double it off, repping aces. Uh, and he check raised me with queen queen four deuce of one of the suits. And I almost jammed because I was pretty confident he was light. But I just ultimately decided like he makes mistakes and check raises hands that he can't fold. So he has stone fucking bottom here. He's literally blocker bluffing. Mm -hmm. But because he had the queen high flush draw, which was the second nut flush draw, I go, well, what would you have done if I potted all in? He goes, I guess I have to call. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, okay, then I'm right. never going to bluff. Right. I will have zero bluffs I, it's in that. It's funny. Note. I had a student. I'm not going to say who it was because I don't want to throw them under the bus. But I had a student who sent me a hand recently where they, they played a spot in a tournament, pretty deep stacked. Block comes ace, queen, seven, two clubs. They have eight, nine of clubs. They, they're out of position. They bet big on the flop, get called. Turn is an offsuit nine, so they turn a pair plus a flush draw. They bet pot, and then they get jammed on, and then they just end up calling off. Right. And it's a torch because, number one, like you, you don't really ever get jammed on as a bluff there by the in-position player in, mm. in practice. And number two, you, your hand now, when you turn a pair... You have so much equity that you really don't want to be in that position of facing a jam. You'd rather check jam yourself. Yeah, or you just check call, right? right. Or yeah, just yeah, check and hope it goes check, check. Whatever it is, the last thing you want is to be bluffing with a hand with that much equity that when you get jammed on, you can no longer fold. Right. So you either have to like keep, you have to bet it or and you have to find like a really annoying fold against the jam because it's a big jam or you just don't bet it in the first place. You right. have to be more polar so that when you face the raise, you just don't get in that spot, you know? Yeah. Did they get there? <laughs> they wouldn't have been talking about it if they right, did. Right, exactly. Yeah, if, exactly. I, I, they they, they won the you, hand. You just never would have got sent I, to I've you. I've done enough coaching to know at this point that when someone sends me a hand that results in them getting it in, <clears throat> they didn't get there. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely fact. And you know we what? Maybe they could be helped by a little bit of mental game work. Uh, perhaps reading Elliot Rowe's new book, A Game Poker. Right. We are going to be doing a quick breakdown of this book tomorrow. But in the meantime, uh, we have a contest giveaway on Twitter. Uh, you can find that at OnlyFriends underscore pod. 
where uh, we'll be giving away a few copies of Elliot's book tomorrow on the show. All you have to do is follow us, retweet, and answer the above prompt, which is what has been your biggest mental block in poker? Be sure to uh, do that over on our Twitter. We'll be giving away a couple of copies of these tomorrow on air. Also, if you would like to submit an In the Muck yourself, be sure to head over to uh, our Solve for Why Twitter. That's at Solve for Why TV. On Twitter, it's the pinned tweet. You can head to our Discord channel. We have an entire uh, we have an entire forum dedicated to In the Muck. Also, big shout out to GTO Wizard. If you guys want to get G- uh, Wizard AI yourself, hit hashtag Wizard in the chat. It'll give you the affiliate link. Feel free to sign up. Let them know where you got it. That's going to do it for us. Hunt, Melissa, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We'll be back tomorrow at noon Pacific. Nikki's going to be in studio. We're going to be doing a review of Elliot's A-game poker, as I mentioned, as well as covering all of the happenings around the poker community. That's going to do it for us. We'll see you guys then. Peace. Peace. Later.